Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I've been asked to give a history of ICH. <clears throat> this is uh, the history as I would like to remember it. It does not mean it's the truth. Uh, I'm going to emphasize people rather than activities because we're going to hear a lot about activities later on. So ICH was started in 1981 by Professor Barry Jones. Barry uh, was the professor of ophthalmology at Moorfields Eye Hospital, and he worked on trachoma and onchocerciasis. And towards the latter end of his career, he realized the importance of epidemiology and public health. And it was with that in mind that he started ICH. When he retired in 1986, he handed over to Gordon Johnson. Gordon had worked as an ophthalmologist in Newfoundland, Canada, providing eye services to the Inuit people. And Gordon had a particular interest in environment and the eye, and also the epidemiology of glaucoma. And it was Gordon who uh, brought together the core reference textbook on the epidemiology of eye disease, which is now, I think, in its third edition. Uh, this is a, a photograph taken from the late 1980s. You can see Gordon and Barry on the front row. Also on the front row is Darwin Minassian. He was the epidemiologist who worked with Gordon on cataract and trachoma, uh, worked with Barry first on cataract and trachoma. Uh, and on the back row is a man called Jock Anderson, who was an ophthalmologist in Kabul, Afghanistan. And then he was uh, very much teaching the clinical side to the students that attended. Um, the lady on the second row was Angela Reedy. She was a social scientist and she began to bring in the aspect of behavior and eye health. On the back row is Pak Sang Lee. He was Mr. Fix-It. Basically nothing would have worked without him and he just made everything tick. And next to him, it is a young me. I came and joined the centre in 1985, having worked in Tanzania. Late in the 1980s, uh, Murray McGavin joined the centre together with Sue, who's over here, Anita and Anne, and they set up the Community Eye Health Journal, which started in 1988 and had its 100th anniversary of journals a couple of years back. Uh, these are some of the master students from those early days. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Hannah, GV and Dakshar because they're all going to talk themselves later on. Uh, but I will mention Baba because I don't think he's here. Uh, Baba um, worked in Nigeria and then Pakistan, and he's now the CBM medical director and also the vice president of IAPB. And these just represent a few of the people that came through ICH in those early days. One of the important things that happened, I think it was 1982, 1994, around that time, was we started this capacity building idea. In other words, not just things in London, but outside. And Adrian Burra, who worked at the school for many years, recently retired, she won two grants, one from the lottery and one from the Nuffield Trust over an eight year period to establish six community high eye health training centers around the world. And many of these centers are still going and we still have links and partnerships with them. So in 2002, so that's after about 20 years, about halfway through our history, ICH moved from the Institute of Ophthalmology to the London School. It wasn't easy, and I'm going to describe that process in a little bit of detail because some of the people are important. Uh, yeah. First of all, the initiator was David Maybe, who I think is around somewhere. Is that right? Hi, David. So David um, arranged for Claire and I to go for beer and pizza. He was never into kind of flash meals. Uh, but said, look, um, Gordon's going to retire in a few years. You're working on trachoma. We're working on trachoma here. It's crazy that two big centres in London are working on trachoma and are not together. So why don't you take the opportunity of Gordon's retirement to move to the school? We spoke to Gordon. 
who kindly agreed. And that was quite something to kind of say, when I step down, I think it's right that you move to the school. The next thing is we had to have funding to do it. And these gentlemen, you probably don't know, this is Christian Garms from CBM and Dick Porter from Site Savers. And at the beginning, they said they would provide five year funding for the center at the school. And without that promise, I don't think the move would have happened. We then had to have the support of the school and Peter Smith was head of faculty. Andy Haynes was the head of the school. And again, it was not easy for them because there was no room at the school to accept new people. And you have this whole thing of salaries and finances and so on. Um, but they were persuaded. We had to write a five year business plan on how we were going to make money. I don't know if we ever did make money, but we had to write the plan and they did accept us. And then last but not least, these two ladies, uh, Viv, who <laughs> made the move happen, if you like, because we all had the idea, let's move, but somebody has to pack the boxes. Right? So Viv was in charge of administration and the administrative team that did the move. And Claire had joined ICH 10 years before and was leading the, the world work on childhood blindness. And it was very important that Claire agreed to move from the Institute to the school as well. And she led the academic team that came over. So when we came over, which was April 2002, we had the masters, we had the journal, we had six overseas partners, we had some research work on childhood blindness with Claire, research work on trachoma I'll mention in a minute, we were 10 people, we had some funding, and we were scattered in three rooms along Gower Street. And literally, to kind of cover the department, you had to walk almost a mile, because we were in different rooms. 20 years on, I just want to point out, we've had five moves at the school. Those moves have been done by those two ladies sat there, who are pictured here. And if nothing is remembered, from this talk, please school, no more moves. <laughs> so I said we had uh, a trachoma grant. When we first came to the school with the help of David Maybe and Joe Cook, who was the head of the International Trachoma Initiative, we got a very large grant to work on trachoma for a few years. And that enabled us to, to recruit four people. And so from my left to right. John Buchan, who was a clinical ophthalmologist and who's now course director here, and he'll talk later on. Anthony Solomon had done a DTM and H and then a PhD on trachoma, and he's now head of trachoma at WHO. Hannah Cooper, who'd done a PhD on epidemiology. After the trachoma work, she subsequently did the cataract impact study for five years and now runs the disability center here at the school and Marcia Zondervan, who'd been an ophthalmic nurse in Africa for 15 years and knew both Anglophone and Francophone Africa, which was important for this study, and subsequently went on to run the Lynx programme that you'll come to. So you see, that was a critical time because those four people very much became part of the backbone of the ICH going forward, and it was all enabled by that first grant. Claire and I were co-directors from ICH from 2002 till we both stepped down at the end of a couple of years ago. And Ch uh, Claire worked on childhood blindness, ROP, national surveys in Nigeria and Sri Lanka, and more recently work on glaucoma and the world report on vision. I want to mention Jyoti because Jyoti has been Claire's right hand for the last 20 odd years and making sure that she caught the plane on time. <laughs> I emphasize the education side of the work that we did, and in 2006, we were awarded the Queen's Prize for Education, which is a very prestigious prize, and this is going to meet the Queen at Buckingham Palace, and it was an opportunity for the Fab Four to get all glammed up, they just love a night out. That's Claire, Viv, Adrian and Hannah. The next big thing was the Commonwealth Eye Health Consortium. And this was a grant obtained by Matthew in 2015, a five-year grant, which extended a bit. Um, 
and which enabled ICH to expand a great deal. And it was based around people, knowledge, and tools. And I, th I think that's a very important concept that, and it comes back to, I think what Matthew was saying about the, the vision or the mission of ICH going forward. I digress for one minute, because one of the things I remember about Barry Jones, who started ICH, was him saying, we're not primarily about giving people knowledge. We're primarily about changing the way people practice eye care, changing people to think about populations and community and what they're doing. So the, um, the Commonwealth Eye Health Consortium, uh, here it's 43 countries. I think in the end, it was more or less all of them, wasn't it, Matthew, that was involved? And here's a few photographs of recipients of different aspects of that uh, grant. Um, I just want to mention in particular, at the bottom there, the three ladies in the middle, Cova, because Cova again ran the master's program for 10 years, I think Cova, uh, before moving, got, before going into links and other things. And this was some of the staff on the Commonwealth Eye Health Consortium. And again, I can't pick out everyone, but I want to pick out Nick, who's on the second row with the white, he's there, second row again, because he ran the clinical fellowships program. And I think that was more than a hundred clinical fellowships around the world in the end, Nick, just an amazing part of the Commonwealth Eye Health Consortium and part of that capacity building. And so in 2020, um, Claire and I stepped down, handed over very gratefully, I mean, we were grateful, he wasn't, <laughs> to Matthew, uh, who had already done the Commonwealth Eye Health Consortium. He immediately set about a Lancet Commission on Global Eye Health, as well as his own very strong research work on trachoma and corneal disease. And I know ICH is in very good hands with him. I would like to point out, we handed over at the beginning of 2020, he already knew ICH was quite a big undertaking. What he didn't know about was COVID and the fact that we'd be in two years of world at home and working and Zoom calls. And that's what Matthew's had to live with over the last two years. And it's very nice that we can now all meet face to face again. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Alan. That was lovely to to uh, see all those lovely old photographs and 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 uh, be, being joined by several of the people uh, in in the room. Um, John is going to come and talk to us now uh, for a few minutes about the MSc course and joined by Chiku virtually, I believe. Yes, that's right. Uh, almost live from Rwanda. We have Chiku. Um, so from the last decade, sorry, is there a click by click? Just on the. So from the last decade, we can report various statistics uh, of the number of masters of students who've graduated, the places they've come from and gone to, the majority from lower or low middle income countries, the majority being supported by various scholarships with equal gender representation and diverse professional backgrounds, as well as diverse geographical backgrounds. We can see the number of students from various locations largely proportional to population, but just as statistics about blindness don't really convey the individual loss that is suffered by people who lose their sight. The statistics of the MSC don't perhaps tell the story very well. So I'm taking you back again, as, as Alan has, to 1982 um, and 1985. And here's some class photos. Uh, and I want to point out just one student to exemplify uh, part of the legacy of the master's program. And you can put your hand up if you think I'm going to point out Hannah Fahl. Uh, I'm not, uh, obviously. Um, hands up again, anyone who's ever heard of or ever seen Samuel Coker in the bottom left-hand corner? No. Oh, Marcia has. Marcia knows everybody. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, Samuel Coker is from Lundsa in Sierra Leone. He was a nurse trained as a cataract surgeon and he studied here in 1982, so it was nearly 30 years later when I, I was working in Freetown that I met him and 
his eye hospital in Lundstad was doing more cataract operations than all the other eye hospitals in the country put together. Um, they ran weekly outreach clinics through their network of established community partners around the, all around the country and with local case finders at each place, bringing in the cataract blind for them to take back and to operate on. And it took my eye unit nearly four years to get to almost uh, the, the level of activity that uh, Samuel Coker had built up over the, the previous uh, 30 years with his outreach team. And uh, that uh, brings me to the point, they say in, in our anniversary here of 40 years, it's really also the anniversary of the impact of our alumni, um, which grows every year, it's like compound interest, as every new batch of students is added. So moving on then to 1995, and again, the, uh, our students here, we haven't progressed yet to color photos, but we have added another 10 years of students by that point to our legacy. Some of those that you'll have heard of um, and some of those that you will not. So we're now going to hear from someone who you probably have heard of, but who we're always happy to hear from again. So um, this is live, or as I say, nearly live from Rwanda. Uh, Chiku's unable to join us, but uh, here she comes. How did I end up on the MSc course? I came on the course as a reward from Site Savers International. They came to evaluate the programs in Kenya, and apparently they liked what they saw in the unit where I worked. Uh, among things being that no matter what time they came to visit, I was always on duty. So in recognition of that, I was offered a partial scholarship by Tide Savers and the other half came from DFID. I was not so excited about coming on the course at the beginning because I knew people who'd been on the course and I just thought nothing changed after the course. But I do say today that it is one of the best things that ever happened to me. I am still and was then a full-time clinician and the additional understanding of how health systems work, of how what public health is, all those were very new to me. And I embraced that and I realized just how much that has impacted the way I perform um, as an ophthalmologist, whether in private practice or in government practice. What impacted me most on the MSc course was the quality of the faculty. You know, the names you read about on papers and books, and you don't ever imagine that you will come to meet them. But to realize that each and every lecturer who came to teach us was somebody who was well known out there, and that you could engage them and you have discussions with them and sometimes even challenge them. I found that experience so enriching. And a reflection of that is, you know, for my MSc, I did a study uh, looking at vitamin A deficiency in prisoners in Kenya. And it, it was a hard study. And a, a lot of people thought it would not be possible to do it. But my supervisor, Alan Foster, said, no, I tried to do that in Tanzania. It was really hard, but I think you can do it and I will support you to do it. And that's how I ended up in one of the maximum security prisons in Kenya doing a case control study. So the quality of the faculty that ICH has, I think that's outstanding. There is no doubt in my mind that ICH is one of the most important institutions that exists in eye care today. To have an institution that focuses on ophthalmologists from low and middle income countries with such dedication and to do things to such high standards is, is unusual. It is a well-governed institution. You know, I watched the transition from Gordon Johnson to Alan Foster. I watched the move from Moorfields to, to the London School. I watched when Alan Foster brought Claire Gilbert in, and now I have seen as Matthew Barton uh, takes over from uh, that generation. It is an institution that is thinking for the future, and I have no doubts that it will continue to grow from strength to strength. I wish the best to the institution itself and also to all those who will be really lucky to come and become trainees or staff in this institution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chiku. Yeah. So 
with nearly 80% of our students being supported to do the course by scholarships, we want to acknowledge those who fund each student. So every funder also has a story and it's with great sadness that uh, we note that the British Council for the Prevention of Blindness that funded so many master's students, uh, funded Chiku's PhD uh, over the, the decades, um, closed down last year as the funding environment has become increasingly difficult through the pandemic. But to those who have been able to continue funding, we are very grateful. Without your funding support, we simply would not have the rich and diverse group of senior academics, opinion leaders, NGO medical directors, educators, and policymakers that we have in the eye care world globally. The output of this course is people with a vision, and it's a, a vision that's giving hope to those people who have lost or are in danger of losing their vision. In fact, we just have time for me to ask if those who are alumni of uh, the ICH MSc could stand up just briefly, just so we can see, even it's just in this room, if you are an, an alumnus. Um, <laughs> There we go, good. So we wouldn't want to remove these people from the panoply of the uh, ICA professionals. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> so um, if the best predictor of uh, past behavior, or future behavior, sorry, is past behavior, then uh, I hope that uh, we will all continue to uh, participate in and to see the growth of this master's program. And uh, yeah. I look forward to that future and being part of it. So thank you. Uh, great. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Chiki, uh, for those recordings as well. Um, I'd like to invite um, Claire Gilbert and Angela Malik uh, to come and talk to us a little bit about the child eye health research that's being done here. Okay. My house is well. Okay. Thank you. Oh, sorry, um, good afternoon, everybody. It's delightful to be here on our 40th anniversary. Um, and I, I've been around for the last, well, since uh, 1990, so quite a long um, period at that time. I'm delighted to introduce Aisha Malik, who's a paediatric ophthalmologist, who is coming in to take my place as I fade out um, and to carry on the work of blindness in children. So we're going to give you a very quick snapshot of of how things have changed in childhood blindness research um, over the, uh, the period of time that I've been at ICH. So starting in the 1980s, Alan had done a lot of work on um, corneal ulceration in children, finding out the different pattern of causes of ulceration. And he, he published a lot on that and also with David Yolston. And in 1987, published a landmark trial of vitamin A supplementation of children with measles showing that it reduced mortality. And this really was one of the early drivers of increasing um, um, vitamin A supplementation and measles immunization and how to, to treat children with measles. And in 1989, WHO hosted the first um, workshop on blindness in children here in London, which I think was chaired by Alan, I'm not sure, but Alan played a key part. And one of the recommendations from that workshop was more that more information was needed on the epidemiology of blindness in children. I happened to have just finished my MD degree. And so I then came in to fulfill that role and was funded for three years to do that. So the first thing we did was to work with the World Health Organization to develop a classification system for the causes of blindness because that wasn't currently available. And while developing and pilot testing and refining that classification, I examined thousands of children who were blind in special education in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, which allowed me to describe the pattern of causes and how they vary depending on levels of socioeconomic um, development. And around that time, Mike Eckstein did a clinical trial for different approaches for uh, surgical techniques for congenital cataract. And it was while I was in Latin America in 1997 that I saw the first child who was blind from retinopathy of prematurity outside high income countries. It was thought to be a disease that occurred in the 1950s because babies were given too much oxygen. 
and it no longer occurred. Um, so we weren't trained in it, but I saw the first child and then I saw more and more children who were blind from this condition. And in Latin America at that time, around 25% of all blind children were blind from retinopathy of prematurity. And in 1999, many of you will be aware of the IAPB WHO initiative called Vision 2020, the right to sight. And quite a lot of the data that I and colleagues had been collecting um, fed into that and meant that blindness in children was included in that global initiative which has had a massive impact in terms of NGO support for developing um, services for, for children. Um, during the, the 2000s, that really was the, the decade of ROP, and many, many workshops were held at national level involving ministries of health, neonatologists, nurses, and ophthalmologists for people who were wanting to set up or improve their ROP services. And Andrew Zinn and I undertook a trial of training nurses in Rio de Janeiro to see if they could improve the quality of the care that they were providing to try and reduce the blinding stages of retinopathy of prematurity. And it was during this time that Dr. Muhit, who was an alumni, um, did a PhD with me in which he developed the key informant method for finding blind children in the community which essentially entails training people who know the community very well, so teachers, religious leaders, people who work for local um, NGOs. And as a result of that, he was able to, to calculate that there were 40,000 children who were blind in Bangladesh, and a third of them were blind from cataract. And the results of um, this study, which was supported by CBM and Sightsavers, were presented to a meeting on blindness in children run by Sight Savers, who then agreed to support what I thought was a wildly ambitious yeah. program in Bangladesh, which was to identify well over 30,000 blind children, set up 16 eye care um, services, and provide lots and lots of surgery. And to my amazement, those targets were pretty well met. And uh, 25,000 cataract operations were performed on children. So this really shows how research can lead to, to policy and program initiatives through IAPB and WHO, and also through developing programs, because that program just would not have happened without that evidence. Um, in um, the 2010, with support from the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust, they also gave a large grant um, to India, which was all managed by GVS Moti through the Public Health Foundation of India for diabetic retinopathy and retinopathy of prematurity. And that was a very large body of work basically to develop models of care for how to provide ROP services within government, um, in, in government neonatal units, bringing in the expertise of the private sector for training and also the NGO sector. So it was really a sort of tripartite um, program. And that led to services being uh, established in four states. I can't remember how many babies now were screened and treated, but it was a very large number. And lots of those uh, providers have now expanded their provision within those states and have started services in other states as well. And working with Priya, um, she undertook two clinical trials of different aspects of spectacle correction and spectacle wear in India. Um, and we also um, undertook a pilot study with another alumni of training uh, staff providing primary care services for children. We added in the eye care component. And this study really showed that those nurses were eager to learn. They saw children with eye conditions. They didn't know what to do. So giving them this knowledge and skill changed their practices. They referred more babies and so on. And in a moment, um, Aisha is going to tell us a little bit more about that. Um, but the end result is that um, uh, in Tanzania, the Ministry of Health agreed to include an eye model, eye module in their program, which is called the Integrated Management of Childhood Illness, which is a program across the country all children under the age uh, of five 
And to date, more than 3,000 children staff have been trained um, to detect and manage eye diseases. Are you changing the conversation? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. I was just meant to talk about the last bit. Sorry. <laughs> That's, Sorry. Thunder. That's all right. So I was just going to say that, yeah, building on the work from uh, uh, Dr. Milton Fury with her MSc work and then the formative research, which was also looking around uh, at primary eye care issues for children. Um, we wanted to create a model for how we could include eye care into routine child health programs. And so we did choose, as Claire said, the this WHO UNICEF joint initiative called the Integrated Management of Newborn and Childhood Illness, or IMNTI. And we chose this for a number of reasons because um, it was well established, had been since 1995, it was present in over 100 countries globally. Um, it works at the primary care level and it included all the key conditions um, for children including ears, but it does not include eyes. So we worked with the Ministry of Health in Tanzania. We developed the eye care module with them. We tested it within their routine IMNTI program and found it to be um, both feasible and acceptable to those primary healthcare workers. And so that was what then led them to include it into their national program. And as Claire said, after the completion of the program, they've gone on to train another 3000 primary healthcare workers, showing it's a really sustainable um, and integrated approach. Um, so then um, uh, further, there was another, another study done by Richard Bowman and um, Godfrey Farhini. They were comparing different devices for newborn eye screening. Um, they found the ArcLight to be the most suitable. And then more recently, um, Claire and I were uh, completed a systematic review for WHO um, as part of their postnatal um, care guidelines, where we recommended that they included newborn eye screening. Um, they very kindly accepted, and those guidance have just been published yesterday. So um, that's been um, you know, a really important kind of exciting win for us because now um, every country, when they're thinking about their newborn care guidelines, will also have to think about how to include um, eye screening for babies as well. So now we also have, um, as well as that, the, we've got the um, eye care included in the uh, IMNCI policy in Tanzania. I think. Claire, did you mention that ROP screening is now included in the WHO Survive and Thrive initiative? So uh, building on this, we wanted to do a health policy analysis, which we've been conducting currently. We've um, been interviewing um, key um, child health policymakers just to try and build on this and to uh, see how we can expand, um, including eye health into um, child health policies in the future. Um, so also during this time, um, we were running our ROP network. This was in six countries across Africa and Asia. Um, this was built around South-South partnerships. Um, some of these countries were starting from scratch with brand new ROP programs. Others were um, scaling up um, already existing programs. Um, and uh, what's been good is that even since the completion of the network, all of those countries have um, continued their ROP programs. Um, another recent piece of work, um, which Claire and I are involved with, which was to, uh, working with UNICEF to develop a target project profile for ROP imaging devices. That's also just been published last month. Um, all of this showing just how um, eye care has been sort of better recognized now within the child health community as well. So moving on to what we are hoping to do currently and in the future, um, at the moment, we're about to start um, creating ArcLight training videos. Um, these will be initially developed to train 800 primary healthcare workers um, in Tanzania, who will then initially screen 100,000 children over four months. But then these will be included into their ongoing um, program in Tanzania, and they'll also be um, freely available for other countries to use. Um, we also plan to do a multi-country evaluation of scaling up um, inclusion of eye care and an IMNCI program. We would also uh, plan to um, evaluate models for telemedicine screening for ROP in Africa, um, including uh, uh, looking at the potential impact of AI in that ROP screening as well. And we hope we can also include this um, telemedicine approach in a future expanded ROP network. So I'm just gonna stop there, but I, um, I would like to just leave the last word 
one for our, it's just a okay i'm gonna leave the last word to our um partners in tanzania okay here we go let me just get this to play during the opening of the modules we thought it would be difficult to incorporate this module in the IMCI. However, after starting implementing, it has become easier than what we thought. The eye care will be covered in the rest of the country. The eye health module has been included in the IMCI training program, so it will continue to be taught to every training program that is there for IMCI in Tanzania. Bada operation, kwenye mwanga anafunua na ule upo umepungua. Anakaa kitako, ananyanikia vitu, anachezea vitu, kama ni pumbali ananifata. Thank you very much. Great. Wonderful to hear about all that amazing, fantastic work. I'm going to hand over now to Jackie, who's going to give us a bit of a summary of the commission. Thanks, Matthew. So I wanted to start by saying it is actually a dream come true for me to be here. I uh, heard Alan speak more than 20 years ago now and decided that day that I wanted to join ICH. And it did take me quite a while to get here, but I wanted to acknowledge and, and thank Alan and Claire and Matthew for being amazing leaders and also to say thanks to my colleagues. It's a really a fantastic team to be a part of. Um, my job today is to tell you a little bit about the Lancet Commission on Global Eye Health. I imagine many of you have, have heard uh, about it already, but I thoroughly enjoyed uh, working closely with Matthew and with uh, Professor Hannah uh, as, as in their role as co-chairs of the Commission. I, I wanted to start by acknowledging uh, all of our supporters, um, and this support enabled us to assemble a team of 73 academics, national program leaders and practitioners from 25 countries. And I also wanted to acknowledge more than 75 people who, additional people who supported us and contributed to the many original reviews and other analyses which informed the commission. In addition to the main report and appendices, uh, the commission's subsidiary papers, case studies and other resources can be accessed through the commission's website and the report and related materials such as a podcast with Matthew and Hannah is, are also available on the main Lancet Commission website. The commission explores eye health from several perspectives, the broad importance of eye health, the scale of the challenge, the economics of vision, the research needed and finally looking beyond 2020 and how to deliver high quality eye care for all. So today I'm just touching on four pieces of work within the Commission that have begun to catalyse action. So in the Commission we examined the importance of eye health from several perspectives, including its impact on quality of life, general health and well-being, uh, and mortality. And our starting point was a systematic uh, scoping review of the looking at the relationship between improving eye health and advancing the sustainable development goals. And in this review, we found evidence that the provision of eye health services is associated with improvements in workplace and economic productivity, household consumption and income and employment. And the resulting economic benefits, particularly when delivered in resource limited settings, contribute to advancing the SDGs on poverty reduction, food security and decent work. We found evidence that providing spectacles to children improves educational performance, supporting quality education. We found evidence that gaps in household expenditure between households with and without someone with vision impairment from cataract did not exist one year after the household member underwent cataract surgery. SDGs 3 and 11 include targets to reduce road traffic injuries, which is a major cause of death in many parts of the world. And we identified evidence that cataract surgery leads to reduced driving collision difficulties and fewer collisions. Globally, healthcare contributes to around 5% of greenhouse gas emissions, and eye care as a high volume service is probably a significant contributor to this. The Commission found only a small number of studies that looked at the environmental impact of eye health services, but there are substantial opportunities to reduce this impact, and this is an area of research members of our team are pursuing. 
So through multiple direct and indirect connections, our overall conclusion was that improving eye health and reducing vision impairment is an important enabler to advancing the SDGs. And this and other evidence from the Commission was used to advocate for the first ever UN resolution on vision last year. Over 100 countries supported the resolution, which enshrines eye health as part of the SDGs. The Commission also looked at several aspects of the economics of eye health. We updated cost effective analyses for cataract surgery and refractive error services, which together account for 90% of vision impairment. And the good news is that both are highly cost-effective interventions. We used the latest data to estimate the global economic productivity losses attributable to, attributable to vision impairment to be 411 billion US dollars annually. And we undertook a systematic review to look at the full extent of economic analysis in vision impairment over the past 20 years. This review found a massive gap between the evidence that's been generated in high income compared to all other countries as well as gaps for some conditions and substantial heterogeneity in the methods used. So these analyses highlighted the need to develop and apply standardized methodological approaches and to be systematic in terms of how we fill the evidence gaps. And ICH has begun to work on this mammoth task, continuing with the collaborative approach that we used in the commission. The Commission also looked back at the 20 years of eye health research to 2020 in terms of where and on what conditions it had been conducted. And we also took a forward looking approach by undertaking a grand challenges prioritization process to determine the critical issues still to be addressed. This was a three round panel exercise which prioritized answer the answers to one question, which is what are the grand challenges in global eye health? where a grand challenge was defined as a specific barrier that if removed would help to solve an important health problem and that its intervention would have a high likelihood of feasibility for scaling up and impact. There were more than 300 participants from 118 countries who contributed and voted across the three rounds. And I acknowledge those of you here who, who did contribute to that, thank you. Um, we generated one global and seven regional lists and the top five global priorities shown here related to refraction services, cataract services, services for children, embedding equity into services and reducing out of pocket costs. So these provide a clear direction of travel for eye health stakeholders wanting to maximize the impact of their work. We're current, currently in conversations about how we might take this forward and think there's a real promise in working collaboratively to establish global and, research, and regional research agenda and a monitoring framework to, monitor, to, to track progress. And our aim would be for groups to galvanize around particular challenges and undertake a broad range of studies to generate the evidence we need. And from an ICH perspective, we've been guided by these lists during our recent strategic planning process and are pleased that we're well aligned with many of the global priorities identified. And a major part of the report is devoted to looking at how we can advance the delivery of high quality eye care for everyone everywhere. And building on the WHO World Report on Vision, the Commission urged countries to consider eye health to be an essential part of universal health coverage. And we argued that UHC is not universal without affordable, high quality, equitable eye care. And I thought I'd finish by sharing one contribution we're currently making in this space, building on the work of the Commission on effective coverage of cataract services and refractive error services. The potential for eye health to provide measures of effective coverage was first demonstrated by ICEH. And these two indicators are now key indicators for global eye health. In response to a request from member states at the World Health Assembly last year, we're now collaborating with WHO and the Vision Loss Expert Group to use data from RAB and other surveys to generate baseline estimates of ECSC and EREC. And we understand from our colleagues at WHO that they will then be nominated to join, to, to join the WHO's UHC index, as well as the SDGs monitoring framework when this is reviewed in 2025. So uh, these are just a few highlights uh, from the Commission. And if you haven't had a chance to read it, I encourage you to do so. And I think we, we have hard copies uh, at the reception uh, later on. So please pick one up. Thank you. 
great. Thank you very much, uh, Jackie. Um, just to re-emphasize that, we, we've got about 2,000 of the things we would really like you to take one with you if you haven't already got one. So, um, great. Um, on, on to something um, else now. Uh, trachoma is the uh, commonest cause of uh, infectious cause of blindness in the world. And um, ICH is part of a, a wider group based here at the London School of Hygiene and School of Hygiene and Medicine working on trachoma. Um, led by David Maybe, Robin Bailey, and uh, Martin Holland and myself. And uh, we've been working together for many years. In fact, David appointed me to a PhD uh, studentship back in I think, probably 2000. That was my first entry into this world of, of eye health. We work on many aspects of trachoma, epidemiology, uh, surveys, pathophysiology, and uh, particularly around uh, the evidence base for trachoma control. And this afternoon, I'm joined by Uma Shafi, come on over. Um, uh, he's a current PhD student uh, leading a research program based in um, Ethiopia. Um, and uh, we're going to share some, some, uh, some things about the current work we're doing and, and recent studies that have been completed. Um, as many of you know, uh, trachoma is being controlled through the implementation of a SAFE strategy. This stands for S for surgery uh, to treat trachiasis, the interning of the eyelid due to the scarring from the infection. A is for antibiotics to control that infection. And F and E, facial cleanliness, environmental improvements, are really focused on reducing the transmission. I'm going to briefly outline some uh, of our more recent work, work really over the last decade, um, looking at uh, different approaches to improve the surgical outcomes and non-surgical outcomes for people with trachomatous trichiasis. And um, this has been particularly um, uh, focused in Ethiopia in terms of the work through a collaboration with the Amhara Regional Health Bureau, the, the Carter Centre, um, Ethiopia team, um, and ourselves here at the London School. And we've conducted uh, four large randomised controlled trials uh, over this last decade. And I'm going to just briefly mention three of them. Um, and this work's been led uh, on the ground by um, Esmail Habtamu, who unfortunately is not with us today. He will be here later. He's at the Trachoma Expert Committee for ITI at the moment. And uh, Saul Rajak, who's uh, an oculopastic specialist based in Brighton. So the first of these trials compared two different types of sutures, silk sutures and absorbable suture called vicral, to see whether there was a difference in the outcomes when you use either of these. And what we found was that the, the results were equivalent. The, 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 the trichiasis came back in uh, similar proportions in, in, in both groups. Um, but what we noted was the, the absorbable sutures have distinct programmatic advantages because they don't need to be removed. People don't need to come back so quickly to have the stitches out. And uh, that reduces both the burden for the patient and the burden for the health system. And that's now become a uh, programmatic praxis in many locations. The second trial looked at uh, people who had uh, mild disease, minor trichiasis, just a few lashes touching the eye, and asked the question is whether this early stage of the disease could be safely managed with repeated epilation. Epilation is the plucking out of uh, eyelashes and um, compared to, to surgery. And uh, what we found was that at two years and again at four years, the vision outcomes and the changes in the cornea from scarring due to the trichiasis were equivalent in these two groups. And people reported, and, and, and indeed they voted uh, because they refused surgery in, in many cases uh, to, um, to, to opt for uh, epilation in the early stage of the disease. And today epilation is becoming uh, increasing a practice, a management practice for, for mild disease. And the third trial I'm just going to mention briefly before handing over to Uma is, is one that formed the core of Esmail's PhD, uh, in which he compared the two most commonly uh, used procedures, the bilamellar tarsal rotation on the right and on the, sorry, on your left, and the posterior lamellar uh, tarsal rotation or Trabru procedure on the right. And what uh, he and the team found was that the posterior lamella procedure, which was much less frequently being performed at stage, had about half the trichiasis recurrent rate at a year. And that difference was sustained for many years to come up to four years. And this has led to a shift in, in training practice and um, the, a preference towards this procedure in, in some countries now. So I'm now going to hand over to Uma. He's going to take over and do that. Uh, Matthew spoke about the S component of the SAFE strategy. I will focus on the A and F and E component of the SAFE strategy. 
currently, as you all know, there are several um, regions in the world where the standard safe strategy does not appear to be clearing infection and disease. We have identified three critical issues in this. The first one is the root of CT transmission and their um, relative contribution to uh, importance to uh, transmission are poorly defined. The second one is the F and E intervention. Uh, Evidence-based to guide programs is really limited. And the third one, particularly in countries like Ethiopia, uh, with the current treatment schedule, the prevalence of uh, trachoma still remains to be high. To try to address these issues, we are conduct conducting a multi-phase um, research program designed to develop evidence to strengthen the uh, existing SAFE strategy. We call this um, Stronger SAFE. So when I say multi-phase strategy on phase one, uh, focuses on understanding transmission with ho within household and between households. We have done extensive household swabbing and testing um, for the infection to try to map out where, the, where uh, this can be found on people, clothing and surfaces. We've also studied the role of flies in the transmission through observational catching flies and testing uh, for infection. We have found the infection on flies, particularly in, in households with people uh, with current eye infection. We have done a very extensive uh, work with communities to try to better understand the barriers to limiting um, trachoma transmission. And now we have co-developed an intervention with the community uh, an intervention package together with the community that is acceptable and which makes sense for the community as well. Basically meaning we are not making these packages sitting in office or from London. We were developing them with the community in the community. This includes strategies to improve face washing and also reduce fly eye contact. At this moment, we are now conducting um, a four arm cluster randomized trial whether the strongest, uh, whether the strongest safe intervention package can be impactful in controlling trachoma. We have 68 clusters. Each cluster has 17, uh, 17 cluster in, in each arm. There is standard antibiotic, standard FNE, a standard antibiotic enhanced FNE, enhanced antibiotic standard FNE, and enhanced antibiotic and enhanced FNE, which we call a stronger safe. When we say enhanced antibiotic, we mean giving two doses of azithromycin instead of a single dose, and we give them two weeks apart. And when I say enhanced FNE, uh, I'll talk about it later. We have what we call face of dignity campaign, fly trapping and um, fly repellent clothing. And our final outcome is actually um, CT infection uh, at the end of that six month. The core fi uh, facial hygiene intervention approach is something what we call uh, face of dignity. Why did we, ch we choose dignity? If you tell people, if, if you tell our community that early stage of infection will finally get you to blindness after 30, 40 years or 20 years, they might find it difficult to connect it. So we have to look for a value that, a value in the community that they care, that they care about. And dignity was rated the highest above the other community values like happiness, love from spouse and uh, respect from our community. So the key messaging is face washing is dignity. Also embedded within the face of dignity campaign we are providing some equipment training to support face washing, which, which uh, complements the campaign and allows people in the community to use limited water. They have access to the maximum to, to the maximum benefit, basically meaning they have some water. The point is uh, prioritizing that water to face washing. And there is some water. So to, to, to make sure that they prioritize that is we are trying to connect that to dignity instead of actually the blindness which will eventually come. And also to control flies, we are distributing fly traps. Um, these are the traps um, and there is a smelling glue inside, flies go inside and then they, because they 
see the light, they go up and then uh, they stay there because they are not intelligent enough to, to see the. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, these are the, the materials that uh, we actually uh, provide with, to the community. This program is funded by Welcome Trust uh, through Collaborative Award. And, uh, and it is a partnership between the Oromia Regional Health Bureau, the Federal Ministry of Health, the Fred Hollows Foundation, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and the Welcome, the Welcome Sanger Institute. We are very thankful for all our partners. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I suggest you catch Uma at the break, either before or after uh, at uh, the, the tea break or at the end and ask him about some of the stories uh, of running this study and, and getting this trial going and keeping it going. It has been the most enormous Herculean effort and uh, hats off to, to Uma. I'm um, going to invite Claire and Hannah to the podium. And um, Claire, you're gonna have a conversation with Hannah. And can I suggest, Andrew, while that's happening, that you might want to flip the presentations because the technology is, my advice is never do a hybrid meeting if you can avoid it. <laughs> Since then, has been involved in many international initiatives, particularly for uh, trachoma control, and uh, she was a president of the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness, and she has been a consultant to sight savers for many years as well. So, Hannah, can you please tell us about the survey that you, or the project that you did after you finished our diploma? Thank you very much, Claire. Um, I would like to start, not to the survey, but to start with Professor Barry Jones, because the course was community eye health. And I thought I'd dress appropriately to reflect the importance of the community. Um, the Ministry of Health of the Gambia in 1986 had a very, very strong primary health care system, but eye care was not part of it. And there I was as the only ophthalmologist supposed to provide eye care to the community. What could I do? The only place we could go to at the time was the International Center for Eye Health, where Professor Barry Jones just gave us all that we needed to go and deliver eye care to a population. The very first task we had to do was a survey. And the lectures on the survey, we had a class exercise on planning a survey, and that translated to a national survey with ICA providing the technical assistance. And without that survey, we would not have the evidence or the data to plan a national program. So that was the importance of attending the ICH at the time. I think I'm right in saying that was the first national survey in Africa. Is that it right? was the first national survey in Thank Africa, you. yes. Can you just briefly tell us what the, the results were and more importantly, how you went on to use those results in the Gambia? Well, the, the numbers, you know, at my age, you don't remember so much, but I can tell you that the prevalence of blindness at the time was 0.7%. We knew that the causes cataracts, corneal opacity, and trachoma were the leading causes. So we knew the prevalence, we knew the numbers of people, we knew the causes, then we could develop a national eye care program based on evidence. And that was involving things in the community, in hospitals, it was throughout the whole Yes, system. Throughout, throughout the country. I mean, you traveled from one end of the country to the other, and we talk about national service, but what you remember are the difficulties of reaching that small village that was picked out in the randomization and having to get there to count and actually make friends with the community and have them to be part of that service. Yeah, and then I was going to say, so you planned the program so that people even in the remotest villages could have access, isn't that right? That, that, that was the end point. It was mm -hmm. really about getting eye health to the community. Thank you. So since that first um, survey in the Gambia, which had a population of less than a million, lessons were learned, and then ICH was um, provided technical support to four national surveys in far larger countries. Uh, so initially in Bangladesh, initiated and supported by Sight Savers, and then in Pakistan, that survey was the second survey that they had done, and it was initiated by the Ministry of Health through their Prevention of Blindness program, 
because they wanted to track change. So the, the first survey had been done 15 years earlier that had been used to plan a national program. And the approach that they had adopted with support from CBM, Fred Hollows and other NGOs was to go district by district, strengthening eye care delivery, training staff, making sure it's operating theatres and managers importantly. So they wanted to go back to the population to see if that had made any difference. So the survey that we helped them to do showed that over a 15 year period, the, pre the prevalence of blindness had halved over that time period, really demonstrating how that approach um, had helped. Um, the other survey, another survey was undertaken in Nigeria, which was suggested by Serge Reznikov. He was the Prevention of Blindness Coordinator at WHO at the time and was aware that there was real shortage of data on blindness in Africa. And so we were commissioned uh, to do that with support from um, Sight Savers and other NGOs. And then the last survey was done um, in Sri Lanka. And those surveys have had a major impact really, allowing countries to plan their services like has been undertaken uh, in Nigeria. And importantly, to identify the subsets of the population who had a higher prevalence of blindness than other um, subsets of the population so that services could be targeted to those people who had less access. And that includes rural communities, often women and people living in rural areas. Um, it also provides um, information for advocacy, for, for more resources, and it provides the basis for further research. And two of the ophthalmologists who played a key, key role in the national survey in Nigeria, so Fatima, who's sitting here, who uh, did our uh, master's first, and then she took part in the survey. And um, we realized that blindness from glaucoma was the highest of any survey reported. So she and uh, another ophthalmologist called Abdul, Mohammed Abdul, both came back to do PhDs with us on um, different aspects of uh, glaucoma. So um, findings from surveys can also help to inform policies. And Fatima has been playing a key role in that in, in Nigeria. And data from these services have also contributed to the global burden of diseases, which is a huge global initiative to um, provide estimates of the number of people who have a huge range, array of, of conditions. And they update the data every uh, 20 years or so as more evidence uh, becomes available. So Hannah, since the first survey in 1986, I understand there have been two more surveys. Yeah. Can you explain yeah. uh, why they were done, mm -hmm. what was found, and what was different about the last one? Well, the 1990. It is its survey laid the foundation for the planning. And we have had two five-year plans after that and conducted another survey in 1996, which showed that the blindness prevalence had dropped by 40%. And it provided a global evidence to start the vision 2020, the right to sight, which became a global health initiative between WHO countries and the umbrella body for all the NGOs. So in, in a way, doing the survey provides the evidence, pulls in the community, pulls in the government to get action at the community level. We have, we have had another survey in 2019, which was a much bigger survey, even including disabilities. And the new thing about it was this time we chose a population cohort to study in depth. So in another five years, we can follow the same people and see what has happened to them. But tagged on, I, I, I think really it captures what this institution is about. The research, the education and the capacity strengthening all coming together in a process that makes an impact uh, on the community itself. And I would like to thank Barry Jones for starting community eye health. Community is the reason for doing all that we do. Thank 
great. Thank you very much, both of you. Andrew, do you want to? Looks like you're great. Um, good. Welcome, Andrew, uh, to talk to us a bit about uh, Peak and other things. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think, like many people here, uh, there's a chapter in my life that starts with, and then I met Alan Foster. <laughs> um, so Alan is largely responsible for a lot of things in my life having gone in a, a certain direction. But in my first meeting with Alan, he said, you really should meet Hannah Cooper and Matthew Burton, who I did have become incredible mentors. And all the work that I'm sharing here is really sitting on the shoulders of giants. Um, I had the opportunity to move to Kenya with my young family uh, 10 years ago now. Um, and I was also doing a population survey, similar to what Claire and Hannah were talking about, building on the expertise that they had here. Um, but it was really difficult. We had so many problems. Um, and although uh, we were able to do really robust research, my mind was always thinking about surely there would be an easier way to do this. Um, many of you are now familiar that we've developed a whole, you know, a lot of technology and so on, but it was really grounded in this idea of how do you find people who are unseen and, and ensure they become visible to the system. Um, and Rob had been going for, you know, three decades and we had the, the pleasure of collaborating across ICH and Pete to develop the latest iteration of that, which is now called Rob 7. Um, and as many of you know, Rob 7 populates uh, a huge amount of our global understanding on the prevalence of blindness. And last year, uh, a new repository was launched. Um, and a lot of the data that's underpinning our current global understanding of the, the magnitude and prevalence of, of eye health issues comes from the, the RAB survey. Um, one, one thing that has always kind of struck me over the last, last few years, apologies that you're seeing a version of my chest up there. Let me see if I can... Uh, so it's going to be talk about technology. <laughs> Maybe minimize. There we go. Thank you. It's not just a PhD mentor. Um, so although we've we've addressed, you know, we've understood that this huge global unmet need for, for eye health, um, one of the things that has change in our you know in the time that ICH has been been around is the proliferation of mobile technology so the current data as of 2021 is 6.4 billion people own a smartphone so not even just a phone but most of the world today are connected on a smart device and behind could we try and close that gap between this huge unmet need and this huge opportunity that technology might provide and I'm just going to give you a very quick whistle-stop tour through some of the key uh, bits of research we did whilst PEAK was being incubated here within ICH. So the first was a study to uh, see, could we develop a smartphone-based vision test that could work accurately in the hands of non-eye health workers? So could uh, people deliver the test to the same level that an eye health worker would? And we were able to demonstrate through several studies that it was. Um, and through a period um, of, of validation and then developing a social enterprise, we were able to launch the Peak Acuity application, which is currently used across 190 countries. And we're constantly hearing stories about how people use it to, in, in their practice. Um, it remains a robust test, but we also realized quite early on that testing vision alone was never going to solve the problem. And so working with a, a friend and colleague who later uh, became uh, my PhD student, Dr. Hilary Rono. Um, we set about trying to answer this challenge that he was facing in his community in Kenya, where he knew there were uh, thousands of children in his community who were not being reached. And in every class, he, he uh, projected that at least three or four children had a vision impairment that was going undetected. But he couldn't justify sending the two ophthalmic nurses he had in an already overrun clinic out to the schools to identify them. So we thought, could we train teachers now that we've developed this application to do that first line of screening and identification? Um, and we're able to demonstrate that it worked really effectively, um, but we needed to build a back end so that once you found those children, they would actually get to the services. And so in that first uh, version of, of, the, of the software, uh, we built something that would enable messages to the parents or guardians if they've been identified. The hospital would be informed if patients were due to come. Um, and we built this into a randomized control trial in which 21,000 
children were screened, 900 identified with a vision impairment. And it was delivered by 25 teachers in just nine days. And this is when we had the first inkling that this could be something that might be an opportunity to go beyond research. Some of the key findings that came from that uh, Lancet Global Health uh, RCT were the ability to identify those in the population with the problem, understand those who'd reached the service, but also understand the quality of the referrals, how many people were being referred and didn't need to, and critically, who was not actually making it to the service. Because this we found was a huge gap in the data. If you found someone, it did not mean that they reached the service. Um, then my colleague, Dr. Priya Morjaria, a leading public health optometrist, said, I'd like to take this further in India. And so as part of her PhD, um, Priya started looking at what would happen if uh, children were identified in schools with refractive error. They were triaged by optometrists and then they were given a free pair of spectacles. What would happen at three months if you did an uh, unannounced visit to see if they were still wearing the glasses? Um, and the findings of the study were fascinating, but what fascinated me was that we could track this process in real time. So we started to, to understand the impact pipeline as it was happening. And Priya continues to work closely across ICH and Pekin is just going to share uh, a little glimpse to the future of something that's been developed. Thank you. Um, so what I've been working on is the School Eye Health Rapid Assessment Tool. And this brings together sort of the experience at ICH about surveys and rapid assessments such as the RAB7, but also Peak's experience on using technology and powering School Eye Health programs. So what is CIRA? CIRA is a School Eye Health Rapid Assessment Tool, which will not only find what is the magnitude of the eye health need for children in schools, but it will also better understand what is the environment where these programs are being embedded. So we know that school eye health programs are very popular and implemented in lots of places. And, and sometimes what the problem is that we don't actually understand what is the actual need in these programs. Is it a refractive error need? Is it a non-vision impairing need? And, and what sort of environment do these programs exist in? What are, who can do the refractions? Where can they go to get their spectacles? What are the referral pathways, et cetera? So we've developed the first prototype for this, and it was recently tested in South Africa. And you can see the results of those here. I won't be too small for you to read out, but what this gives us an understanding of is that when we did the first implementation of the program, these are the sort of results we found that 70% of children passed the screening and left the survey. 19% of children who were referred um, either needed a refraction or had another condition which could be dealt with on the spot. And so there was very few of those who actually needed to go on to get specialist treatment. Zira is being developed in collaboration with a global advisory group. And at first we met like this for a while. And now uh, just last month, we were able to meet in person where we had the first face-to-face -face advisory group. And we went through the results of the first prototype and agreed on what it is that we need to trial for the second prototype, which we'll be doing now in May, again, back in South Africa. Thanks, Priya. <clears throat> so similar to the work we've been doing in school eye health, we've also been uh, working in community eye health. And as part of Dr. Hilary Rono's uh, PhD, he also looked at could he connect community health workers using PEAK at the household level to the primary system and then to the, to the hospital. And the key findings from the study were that at the baseline, the majority of people coming to the hospital had a condition in orange, which is a primary eye care need. So 61% of people had a condition that didn't need to be managed in the hospital, and only 8% were coming with cataract, refractive error, and glaucoma. And when we embedded this system, more than three times the number of people accessed care, but the hospital saw no more people, just different people. And this was a really good demonstration of changing the system to bring care closer to people that needed it, but better utilization of specialist services at the hospital. And the way we do this is uh, through what we call Peak Solutions. So Peak Solutions is made up broadly of two components. We have uh, Peak Capture, which is uh, the software application that sits in health centers or in the hands of healthcare workers that captures the journey of the patient. And then Peak Admin, which allows you to see what's going on in that program in real time. 
Peak Admin also allows you to set up the journey of the patient or patients um, based on that health system and how things work in that context so that it can be uh, adapted as the program evolves and learns. And what that might look like in practice is uh, a community health worker or a teacher screening in, in a home or a school. And if they're identified with a vision impairment, then then automatically refer to one of the predetermined locations based on their condition. But critically, the program manager can look across the whole data as it's happening to really focus on who's being left behind. So that data that used to be a footnote in terms of did not attend, you find is often 80% of people screened. And so when you can start to see who is it that's not attending, the programme can actually be designed with equity in mind in terms of how can we change the programme for their benefit. And what we've found now consistently across our programmes, and you know, with special thanks to CBM, Christian Blind Mission, who've been our anchor NGO partner since we spun out as a social enterprise, is this change in the way that programmes work in that if you take orange again, here's those with a primary eye condition and and red as those with a more serious complex condition, what was happening is very few people were getting any eye care at the primary level and the hospital was full. Everyone had too many patients, but most of the people in the hospital had a condition that didn't need to come to the hospital. And then when the system was connected and integrated, the composition changed. Many more people are getting eye care, but the people with more serious conditions are being managed in the hospital. And, and the data that came from the trial work in, in Kenya, plus many other papers, program reports, advocacy, media, led to this being adopted into Kenya's national eye health strategy. And with CBM, um, there's been the launch of this new vision impact project, which President Uhuru Kenyatta was due to launch yesterday. It's now due to happen next month, where it's really a strategic partnership with the government to embed eye care. In, in this way across, across the country. And we're really proud to be uh, a partner in that. We also, if any of you were at the IAPB meeting last year, will have heard, um, sorry, last month, President uh, Masisi of Botswana, himself a former teacher, uh, talking about how he's now gonna use PEAK uh, within their Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education to screen and treat every single school child in the country. Um, and he's now come forward to say he's gonna be an ambassador for school eye health globally. Um, so we're really excited by the role technology is playing in terms of raising the understanding, but also raising the awareness in terms of uh, this is a global issue. And I'm just going to touch on one case study, um, which has been in Pakistan, where uh, the, 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 we, I think it's like no program anywhere else, we've been pulled rather than trying to push. We're, we're constantly trying to keep up with the work that they're doing. Um, and one of the transitions has been this kind of manual vision testing, manual data collection into automated uh, vision testing, automated data collection and learning in the program. And the system there is now connected from end to end, from, from the schools and household level to primary, secondary, tertiary centers. Um, and what that looks like in practice is that programs are able to learn and improve constantly. So in one of the early programs, this data showed that the health centers uh, within a certain proximity to the referral site were getting many patients turning up. So the line to look at here is the red line. So 95% of people who were found and referred made it. But if you look at all the facilities that are red, one in five people referred made it. And the key data point here was whether you had to walk or whether you had to take transport. And so learning from that program, the, the program leaders there adapted the program, evolved how it worked to completely transition that. So you can see, the locations furthest away no longer were being discriminated in terms of their opportunity to, to get care. Today, that program in Pakistan has over 130 connected health facilities. They're currently onboarding over 1,500 schools. And very excitingly, uh, last month started training 1,500 lady health workers who will go household to household. And what we've seen so far in that program is consistent to what we've been seeing in the trials, a huge increase in the proportion of people accessing care, but a complete change in the composition of those turning up at the hospital. So specialists are spending more time doing specialist activity. Um, and if time allows, I'm going to give you a little view to the future. Uh, we started a, an exciting Welcome Trust and NIHR funded uh, collaboration award, which is between uh, the centre here um, and partners in Kenya, Botswana and Nepal, um, and we're trying to learn from technology industry where 
the mantra has always been fail fast, learn faster. What is it that they're doing in industry to sell products and uh, sell marketing? Uh, how can we bring that into the public health arena where we actually have a different mindset of do no harm and therefore have to be very careful and slow? And so what we're looking at doing is three things, better understanding who is being left behind, co-creating with them solutions, and then doing randomized uncontrolled trials. So what this looks like is getting more data on the groups being left behind. So capturing more than we currently have in terms of things like gender, um, their, their socio-demographic status, so we're starting to get a better understanding of the, sp the specific subgroups who are less likely in any given context to make it to care. Um, and we're trialing different ways of collecting that data in a way that keeps the program streamlined. And then pulling that data together to, to help us understand who are the groups who are most being left behind in any given program. And then working with those groups to co-create potential solutions to, to that. So bringing together focus groups, using different ways to connect with them to understand how would they propose that these barriers are overcome. And then because we expect many proposed solutions to be created, we're looking at doing randomized uncontrolled trials. So this is what the tech industry have been doing for years to sell you flights and sell you any anything that you buy online. Um, but starting doing things like A-B testing. So within, for example, a school program, you might hypothesize that text messages are better than voice messages. But rather than having to run a large randomized controlled trial, certain people will automatically be given one of the decided interventions. And we can start to test that very rapidly in real time to see which of those start to have a meaningful effect. Um, and pulling that together uh, gives us this new constant learning loop of uh, understanding those who are being left behind, co-creating solutions with them and then testing them rapidly. And we were very fortunate to be together, Matthew and I and our, and our uh, colleagues in Kenya recently to, to build on this work. Um, and so as, as the programs go deeper and become more equitable, they're also scaling um, into many different countries. And, and some, I think some of the most exciting part of that is, I think part of what the DNA of this center has been around, how do we learn and share our experiences? Um, and this was pre-pandemic, we were able to bring together many partners to discuss and share learnings. And, and I think my highlight of that meeting was hearing uh, the team in Pakistan speaking to the team in Zimbabwe about how they'd overcome an issue that the team in Zimbabwe were facing. Um, and they were able to apply that into our program. And, and this, these are the, I suppose, the ultimate reason why we all do the work that we do. Um, for this lady, Kiase Halimi, who's a, a farmer in Zimbabwe, receiving a pair of glasses for the first time. Um, just, you know, I think that look says it all, and that's ultimately why we're, we're here. And I feel really privileged to be uh, a part of the International Centre for Health. Thank you. Andrew, thank you very much. Um, we've come to our halfway point. Um, we're going to have a short break now. Ideally, we'd start again at about four. That's 20 minutes. So if we say about five past four, um, if you'd like to head up the stairs and then down the main stairs all the way to the basement, um, and you'll be directed to uh, where, we, where we've got some tea and coffee set up. Um, and we're, we'll, we will start at, at five past with the Lynx program and something on retinoblastoma, I believe. Great. Thank you very much for coming back so punctually. Um, moving to our second half now, and uh, we're going to start with hearing from uh, Marcia and Richard about Vision 2020, Lynx program, and uh, the retinoblastoma network. So over to you guys. Right arrow there and just stand. And everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure to be able to give you a little bit of information and update on the Vision 2020 Links program. And the Vision 2020 Links program started, it's a partnership program, which started in 2004. And it was really um, developing a formal approach to establishing and maintaining long-term whole team partnerships. Um, between institutions in Africa and institutions and eye departments in the UK. And this program has grown over these years since 2004. And um, we are now in, in 18 countries and more than 30 partnerships. 
So one of the important things of the success in a partnership is recognizing and identifying what the priority needs are in the overseas or in the partner institution, wherever that is. Um, we began in Africa, um, but the aim was really to enhance the quantity and quality of eye health services in the partner institutions. Um, it soon became apparent that the learning was not just in the overseas partner institutions. It had actually become apparent that the learning was more than mutual and the gains within the NHS were reported time after time after time. So our funding for the program um, over these, the partnerships over these years has come through um, UK government via FET. We had a lot of funding through there and through the Scottish government, as well as long-term core funders, CBM, Site Savers. And we've continued to find, to look for um, core funders. And this program, as I mentioned, this program is now in 18 countries and, in, and we have, um, it has grown organically. And it has grown into areas of specialist needs, which have been um, prioritized by these participating links. Oops. So we have established three networks so far, um, which are formalized. And that's the Diabetic Retinopathy Network, known as the DRNet, the Retinoblastoma Network, known as the RBNet, and the more recent, the Glaucoma Net. Now these networks will be described in more detail by um, some of our technical leads in further presentation. So I won't go into details about this, but we will begin with the RBNet um, as one of the introductions to the networks. These networks were formed because of a requested need for shared learning. Shared learning from others who were involved in similar situations and from those partners who had services that were more developed. So an opportunity to learn from one another. We received funding from the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust, which provided an opportunity to meet together, to work on tools and protocols and to develop these and to help develop the capacity building activities across the partners. Even during this difficult time of the pandemic, these networks were able to continue online. And um, Richard Bowman is going to talk to us about the RBNet and our colleague, Didi, and Didi Fabian, um, who isn't here to join us today, but Richard and Didi are working with us in the RBNet. Richard. Thanks very much. So it's not often as eye specialists we have the chance to save the lives of our patients, but when cancer affects the eye, that can happen. And retinoblastoma is a cancer that affects children's eyes. And we now have this global network that is aimed at helping each other to do just that, to save the lives of children, in addition to preserving their eyes and vision where possible. And this network now involves 24 countries in four continents, but it started with these bilateral links programs in East Africa, India, and the UK, and has built up from there. It's based on knowledge sharing and development of partnerships. And even in the UK, if we're managing a, a problem like retinoblastoma, we need uh, a, a, multi, a multitude of different professionals. Eye surgeons can't save the lives of these children by themselves. And uh, so when we 
launched this network in Hyderabad five years ago, it was great to see not only representatives from many different countries, but also from many of these different professions right from the beginning. And the aim right from the beginning was to improve outcomes for children to save lives. And so the emphasis was on practice. practice. We had a, an issue of the journal devoted to highlighting the problems of retinoblastoma and how to manage it. We developed a practical management toolkit or manual. Uh, even we started right at that uh, initial meeting and it's been updated by leading experts from around the world. Ashwin Reddy's helped, he's here today. Um, but also by doctors practicing in low and middle income countries who know the constraints there and give a realistic um, protocol about what can be done. There was so much enthusiasm and traction that we thought this also represents a chance to actually find out what's going on in retinoblastoma around the world. Victor said, shall I remove the slide that doesn't have anything on it? But this is, this is what was known about Global RB before the RB net happens, he says modestly. And uh, I had to have one graphic in after Andrew's uh, performance. So <laughs> during 2017, we recruited um, as many of the new cases of retinoblastoma from around the world as possible, thanks to a Herculean effort from, from doctors and professionals in all those centers that you can see there, and from Didi Fabian, who Marcia mentioned, who's based in Tel Aviv, but also here at the school. Um, we collected half, over half the world's cases from that year which is an amazing uh, research uh, resource, a big cohort of patients. And uh, we started analyzing it. Straight away, we found that, sure enough, in low and middle income countries, children present later with a, a, a bigger lag time. And because of that, the tumor is more likely to have spread outside the eye by the, by the time they come for treatment. And that means they're going to have a much less chance of surviving. And in fact, we have just collected the three year outcome data from that cohort. And sure enough, if you live here, you're virtually guaranteed to survive. But if you're in a low income country, it's 50 50. So there's a big disparity. And this is the first time we've really shown those figures that the glaring inequality and the reason for it, two real reasons, awareness and accessibility. That's why they present late. Um, and we looked at a couple of particular issues. So gender, we know that retinoblastoma affects boys and girls equally, but there were more boys in our, our sample. So some girls are left to die without ever seeing medical treatment. And looking at the geography of that, that seemed to be more of an issue in Asia and India. So that gives us uh, a challenge to work on. Uh, <clears throat> and another issue we found was 5% of this cohort actually had to travel across uh, national boundaries to get treatment. They didn't have the, the uh, facilities they needed in their own country, in some cases across continent. So those are just two examples of some of the um, research that's come out of it. But there were biological findings as well with such a big cohort. We found that, okay, children present in Africa with more advanced disease. We think that's because there's a big delay in them presenting and they present older. But actually, even if you allow for that older age, they still present with more advanced disease. So there may be a biological difference in the way the tumor's behaving there. Maybe there's an infective cofactor or a genetic difference. So that gives us a new hypothesis to work on and take research forward. So we've probably published 10 or so papers from that cohort, but we're not losing our original vision of improving outcomes for individual children. And this is a relatively recent development, the national uh, multidisciplinary team meetings on Zoom, which happen most months. They already involve at least 14 countries from around the world. Again, leading experts in retinoblastoma and doctors trying to manage children in difficult situations, not knowing quite what to do, having discussions about individual cases. And that's, that's really taken off well. There's a website that Nick started and it's got 450 people um, on it already. And just to finish with, thinking about those two arms of the network, the research and the capacity development, improving outcomes for individual children. We're thinking about the future and could we take that amazing data repository of 4,000 uh, patients from one year, could we create a live data repository We've got partners in Tanzania who are developing programs, uh, electronic patient records, and something called Clever Chemo, which where basically you 
enter the patient's clinical details, how they're presenting, and the program will tell you how to manage them, what, what chemo to give and what dose to give it. And there are quite a lot of um, errors, even fatal errors in giving chemo around the world for this thing. So if we had a combination of a live data repository where doctors from low income and middle income countries can enter their cases, so updating the database, but they also get automated advice on how to best to manage the, the patients, that that would be a, a, a great thing. So if anyone wants to fund that project, please see me afterwards. Uh, that's the home team. And thank you very much to every one of them for their efforts. Brilliant, Marcia and Richard, thank you so much. Um, amazing, more than half the kids presenting in a year globally. Um, I'm gonna invite Kova and GV up now. And uh, they're going to tell us a, a, sort of a similar sort of story about a, the diabetic retinopathy network work. Okay. Uh, just go on that. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Matthew. And uh, we started this project, which I'm going to describe in 2014. I still had some black hair that time. In 2019, by the time we finished the project, everything was great, thanks to Andrew. And if I spend an extra minute, Jackie and Victor will see that I don't have any hair. So let me just get into the presentation straight. So this was a project funded by the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust. And we followed the entire planning cycle in developing this particular project. We had a situation analysis conducted in the most populated metropolitan cities of India, used those findings to develop a plan, went to the stakeholders, including the government of India and the national program, to look at getting a buy-in for integrating diabetic retinopathy services in the public health system, at least as a pilot project initially. And this was, unanimously decided in the stakeholder engagement that we need to move away from an eye clinic when we're looking at increasing the number of people screened for diabetic retinopathy and get into a diabetic physicians or what we have in India, the non-communicable disease clinics. And that was the paradigm shift, which was unanimously <coughs> decided upon. And we looked at bringing about linkages at four different levels, getting people to talk to each other, the physicians and the ophthalmologists, the government and the NGO sector, get them to talk to each other about how to implement the blindness and the non-communicable disease program, getting them together and finally building a referral network, which is robust and functional between the primary and secondary levels of care. A range of approaches were used. It could be a static facility or a mobile facility, reporting on the spot or remote reporting, a comprehensive screening for all complications of diabetes or a standalone diabetic retinopathy screen. We looked at four major domains in rolling out this project. Advocacy to create an enabling environment, so that the policies could be implemented. The strengthening of the health systems, which was the meat of the project, trying to look at the government public health system and how we could strengthen that to deliver these services, empowering communities and families so that they could tackle diabetic retinopathy and the uh, diabetes uh, in a better manner. And within that, we also embedded research both operational as well as hospital-based implementation research. We looked at 10 pilot districts. The yellow are the states where we went in. The entire state is not covered. One district in each of these states, 5 million populations. The entire project was based at the non-communicable disease centers and looking at capacity building and infrastructure support. We looked at those people who were registered, people with diabetes who were registered with the government health system, and they were provided the facility of getting the funders examined and referral to a secondary center wherever required. During a two and a half year period of implementation, 
able to sensitize more than 6,000 health workers, nearly 600 physicians being trained, more than 225 eye professionals being trained for screening, 40 ophthalmologists trained for uh, treating, 10 district hospitals had their infrastructure supported, and 60 the primary health facilities being provided the infrastructure over a period of that two, two and a half years, more than 66,000 people were uh, screened and 6% were treated as part of the project. Some of the outputs, we had hospital-based studies, we had operational research studies, 22 publications during their entire uh, project period, developed technical guidelines, both operational as well as technical guidelines at the national level, a website, dedicated outputs in relation to IEC material and manuals to improve practice. We had facilities, like I said, both at the primary level where we had auto, where we had uh, funder screen, uh, screening, we had vision testing, and at the base hospital, facilities including OCT, laser, and treatment for medical treatment, retina treatment facilities were provided. Last slide, scaling up and sustainability. What we were interested in is that this should lead to further enhancement of diaptic retinopathy screen services in the public health system. What we find is that many international INGOs are now supporting the diaptic retinopathy initiative in India. We've been able to see that in five states of those 10, the program has been scaled up to other districts and in one state, the entire state and equipment skills and skills are available in more than 100 facilities. The trajectory would have been even sharper, but for COVID, people are getting back now on making up for the lost time. Thank you, Koa. Next to you. So um, another of the uh, areas of work of the diabetic retinopathy at ICH is the diabetic retinopathy. Um, network uh, starting in 2014 as part of uh, the Community Eye Health Consortium, which was another grant from the uh, Queen Elizabeth Diamond, and, um, Diamond Jubilee Trust. And it brings together now 36 diabetic retinopathy screening and treatment programs from uh, 17 low and middle income countries, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, but also Pacific, uh, Caribbean and um, India. Uh, these are all centers that are working to prevent uh, visual impairment through diabetic retinopathy, uh, through establishing sometimes from scratch or scaling up the implementation of, of screening and, and treatment programs for DR. Um, as Marcia mentioned, this network also started uh, underpinned by the LINCS program. So after a few years of uh, LINCS partnerships having cataract or glaucoma as priorities, it became clear that many of them, particularly in Africa, started asking for help to establish diabetic retinopathy programs and is bringing those links together uh, that started the, the network. Uh, the objectives of the DR Net were to, to uh, coordinate and facilitate uh, building national frameworks and also guidelines at national level for DR services, also to promote the integration of DR services and treatment services in general uh, health systems, diabetic services mainly, uh, and also to assist with technology and with infrastructure challenges that the programs were facing. And finally, to uh, help with clinical skills and knowledge has changed where, where needed, depending on the level that, that each program was at. Uh, the original target was very clear, it was to treat one more patient per week over the time that the, the first five years of the program, that was greatly exceeded. And in, from baseline, uh, the program increased the number of screened patients by 88% and the number of treated by 47% across all the DRNet uh, members. Just to give an example of what's happening, particularly now since the pandemic, uh, we have regular workshops every year 
And in one of the surveys that we ran with all members, the big challenge in the pandemic was that the graders were losing their skills. So a lot of people were taught to grade uh, as part of the programs to screen during the first five years, and they didn't have enough exposure to patients. Um, so as a DRNet, we created a virtual DR grading training and quality assurance, which has two, two uh, components. One is in partnership with the uh, University of Gloucester, there's a system called the ITAT, where the graders can get 20 images every month that they grade and get feedback on. And then we have, just like the MDTs that they do for RB, we have uh, quarterly grading ground rounds where we meet live, not face to face, but, but online. And we have live uh, images that we comment on uh, and they help with quality assurance. Some of these programs are becoming now part of the formal quality assurance of the programs at the government level, particularly in the Caribbean. And that's really it from the DRNet. Just a quick comment about DR research. There's a, a keen team on, on DR research at ICH. Um, we have from the DR network, we're about to publish a compendium of uh, papers from um, African DR programs, which will come out in, in I as a supplement soon. Uh, we also conduct evidence reviews to do with diabetic retinopathy uh, in collaboration with the Fred Hollows Foundation. And uh, we're working on, on real world uh, application of AI in, in independent uh, um, evaluation of AI in real world programs with some of the DRNet partners. Um, in the last few years, we've had um, PhD students near Wira Miwangu and, and alumnus works both on, she did a lot of work on DR guidelines, which resulted in the national DR guidelines in Kenya and analyzed the process for the adapting guidelines at national level. And she also uh, tested the strategies, peer support interventions to, to increase the access of uh, people with diabetes to um, eye examination. That was through a clinical trial. And currently, Charles Cleland is also uh, about to start a clinical trial in Tanzania for the implementation of um, artificial intelligence to improve uh, patient outcomes. And that's it, I think. So. Vivian Kobe, thank you very much. That was, that was fantastic. Um, can I invite Fatima and uh, Heiko, who are going to uh, share with us something of the, uh, the glaucoma work uh, that they're leading on here at the moment. Um, hello, everyone. It's, it's really lovely to be here. I think LSHTM ICH is such a wonderful place to work. And I'm very grateful for that. It's actually such a blessing working with people like Matthew, Claire, Alan. There's also that story when I met Alan. And um, very encouraged by Hannah Fowl, who has been a lovely, wonderful mentor. So I'm very grateful to be here. And it's a great team. And when I did my MSc, that was 20 years ago. So I've been part of this journey for about half the time of what we're celebrating today. And Hannah Cooper there was my tutor. I came to her saying, I want to do surgery because I came from a very clinical background. And she was like, oh, well. so right now, it's like the public health aspect of it has actually helped me in what I do. And one of the things that came up at the time was the um, Nigeria survey which I participated in, and we developed data. We, got, we found data that was very telling of the glaucoma that was out there. And it was one of the most severest things that we did. Sitting in our clinics, we knew that they came in very severe. Over 50% of the patients with glaucoma that we saw were already blind. Um, more than that, blind in one eye. And it was necessary to go out there and find out what was happening. And that was what we found out during the survey. And some of the um, research that we have done has actually shown that glaucoma is a blinding eye disease in Africa and probably not so in other parts of the world. And that also informed a lot of the investigative or treatment research that has been done. One is the um, Kilimanjaro glaucoma intervention study, which 
is done by Hako, who who will tell us a little bit more about it in a minute. And the other one is um, the Bochi laser feasibility study by Abdu, who is doing it in Bochi, Nigeria. Other findings also told us more about glaucoma in Africa. Some of them were qualitative studies and really sad, really difficult to read because one said, so let me find my way, whatever it will cost me, rather than leaving myself in darkness. Um, this looked at experiences of patients with glaucoma and it was really hard to take information from such people. And then we also noticed that we actually confirmed that glaucoma was the silent thief of sight because it creeps on the patients without really knowing because they're not able to understand the symptoms at the earlier start. So what was the journey like? In 2010, we had the first Africa Glaucoma Summit in Accra, Ghana. And here it was to strengthen and incorporate glaucoma management training and education in existing programs of the World Glaucoma Association. In 2012, it was a reinforcement at the Kampala Resolution on Glaucoma. And then in 2012, the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust Fund, which was run by the Common Eye Health Consortium, was almost like an exponential growth because it trained subspecialists in glaucoma who went back home to, to, to um, practice, to give the adequate optimum practice for glaucoma. But there were other things that needed to be done. And so we formed the Glaucoma Clinical and Research Network. I will tell you a little bit about that. Um, the issue was we needed to give affordable and effective treatment for glaucoma. And we also noticed that we had to monitor individuals for progression and how they treat, how they use their treatment. The whole aim is to preserve sight in people with glaucoma. And we had um, eight main activities. The first one is the best practice toolkit, which was developed by Africans. We had a group of consortium of um, different glaucoma experts and ophthalmologists from different parts of Africa who sat down together and formed the tool. And another one is the training, which is the highlight of the LINCS program. Um, it's yet to start physically due to COVID, but we've had training with the Moorfields Eye Hospital, with the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, University of Calabar, and a number of places in Africa. And there are Tanzania, Uganda, places we want to twin. Then we also have the glaucoma disc, which is the decision intervention support cluster. And we've had meetings online for that. So far, we've had um, over about 14 countries joining us on that disc. And there are other things that like the research, the training, which is going, um, going to happen with the, with the glaucoma network. And the glaucoma network is now the baby of the Vision 2020 Links program, which is um, run by Marcia. We just heard about the diabetic retinopathy, the retinoblastoma, and then now it's the um, glaucoma Links program. And these are the academic lead. Um, I don't have the fancy photos, but <laughs> Dan Kiage is from Kenya. Uh, Winnie Nolan is at Morfield's Eye Hospital and also here at the London School. Heiko is from Germany, who will be speaking in a moment. And Abdul, Mohammed Abdul is from Nigeria. He's doing the laser feasibility study at Bauchi. Um, just a clinical reminder of how severe we see. This is a 23-year-old man and his IOP at presentation was 40 in one eye and 50. This is skyrocket intraocular pressure and severe cups disc ratios, which means he was severely affected. And at 23, this was really something that we have to think about and tackle. So what's the outlook today? How to best provide equitable, affordable, high quality, glaucoma care for the next 10 years is what we're looking at. Um, yes, we do want to use some of our competencies that we already exist, and we need to define what equitable glaucoma care is. 
and we need to check how much of um, glaucoma service treatment or coverage is available. And we have to think globally, but with a focus in Africa where the need is most. Um, yeah, so I'll hand over to Heiko, who will tell us a little bit about some treatment work he has been doing. Thank you, Fatima. So I want to start with Ngare Musi. Um, he's a patient with glaucoma and he allowed us to tell his story and it actually stands for many, many uh, glaucoma patients. And the key, key challenges for him was uh, he didn't know where to go. He realized he has an eye problem. He was a businessman trading fish and um, he moved already from being a fisherman to being a businessman only in trade. He also was a father and of three children and husband. And <clears throat> finally he came to us, but needed more than a day of travel. His mother had glaucoma, but nobody helped him to connect the dots that he also was at a higher risk to develop the same disease and what to do at what time. So long distance, limited awareness. And then as um, Fatima has alluded to already, once many patients come to be seen, the disease is already very advanced. So we cannot turn back the wheel, but what we can do at least is try to prevent it from getting worse. And what we then, the main thing we do is that we reduce pressure. <clears throat> and there are three ways in general to reduce pressure. Eye drops, and the challenge with eye drops is they have side effects. It's a nuisance to take eye drops. And there are also costs to them, especially in longer term, cost add up. And often they are not available or only very few options are available. We also have surgery, which is a very potent and strong way to reduce eye drop. But um, doing surgery has a long learning curve. There are not enough um, surgeons well trained. And also sometimes patients are hesitant um, to accept surgery or sometimes even clinicians are hesitant to offer it because they know they will not improve vision and uh, it can be a challenge. So then there's and this is where uh, the story continues with a link. Um, I had the privilege to be part of a, the link between KCMC where I worked at that time in Northern Tanzania and Birmingham here where I actually was this morning uh, with Professor Pete Char long time ago, <clears throat> also some changes here. And um, we, we thought about this idea of a laser as well. And there's one laser in particular called selective laser trabeculoplasty. It's a five minute procedure. You can do it as an outpatient procedure. Patients can go home afterwards. It's being taught relatively quickly and easily. It, it basically cleans a sponge type structure in the eye which drains the, the fluid out of the eye. We don't exactly know what it does, but there's probably something uh, it does. But nobody has looked into it formally in an African country yet. We had some promising pilot data from different colleagues, but nobody looked at it. So by that time working at KCMC, I worked together with Matthew also. We also, also were next door neighbors. So uh, we continue these ideas. Um, this was one iteration of them. I'm, I'm very impressed by this forearm trial. Actually, um, our funders refused to fund forearms, so we, we settled for two. We compared the laser, as I said, with the Timolol eye drops, which is a standard treatment. Uh, we also had some guidance and oversight from a group of patients led by Professor Mlai on the left side. And also, I'm very grateful for Stephen Gichu's help on the data and safety monitoring board. So, what were the results of the comparison? This Kaplan Meyer graph shows with every step eyes which did not have a low enough pressure and they um, left the trial over time. And the, the gray line stands for the drops. And you can see many eyes had to leave the trial earlier than uh, the blue line, which is the SLT. So that, that was a very impressive difference um, for the laser. <clears throat> These are the uh, one year data. We also looked at acceptance of treatment, safety, quality of life, um, visual acuity, preservation of visual acuity and cost. I don't want to into more details. If you follow the QR code, um, you will end up at the publication, hopefully. 
So coming back to our patient, what does it matter uh, in real life? So we treated him also with the laser. And at least for three years, we were able to keep um, this small island of vision, this uh, light area in the center of these spark spots. Usually every, most of us will have a, um, a completely white visual field. So this is uh, one example where we, we want to move forward. So this is Ainotti, uh, who is continuing now our work at um, KCMC, which is also part of the, the link or the network. And yeah, we just need to deliver earlier and hopefully better interventions. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Fasma. <laughs> Uh, yeah, about all the work that's going on in glaucoma. Can I invite Daksha to, to join me? Um, Daksha is going to um, speak about um, opening up eye health, which she leads here. Thank you for this opportunity. And it's a real pleasure to see so many uh, old friends here. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled to, to see that we also have a lot of people online as well. Um, Really, you, you would have um, guessed by now that responding to public health knowledge needs is huge. And unlike many other ophthalmic clinical training programs, what ICH does is really about how do we find out what's happening in the population level? And that really needs a whole different set of knowledge and skill sets that are required. And so much of our educational work is towards how do we equip clinicians, educators, researchers, and leadership to think in a public health way. Um, so delivering education isn't as simple as, as we'd like it to be. It's not as accessible as we'd like it to be. We know that there's a cost attached to coming to ICH here in the, in the UK. And of course, we want to maintain the same quality experience right across any location that might be delivering this kind of education. So the questions that ICH has been asking for many years, and I wouldn't say it was just this last period, but over the years, I'm going to give a shout out to Sue Stevens there, who's tried to set up resource centers to provide access to knowledge. Alan ran many, many overseas workshops to get the knowledge out there. We also had a lot of preloaded CDs that were distributed at almost every conference that we went to. And of course, we tried to set up regional training. So with, with, with that as a backdrop, we know that we were trying to address this, this educational iron triangle. What happened in 2014 and subsequently was that we decided to use technology towards addressing some of these uh, needs, knowledge needs that are out there. And using a core team, and I give a shout out to Astrid, Yelena and Rom, who are part of the core team that work here in education, we started to work internally within ICH and LSHDM. So we collaborated with over 40 internal collaborators, but more importantly, we had collaborations externally from over 80 plus different people around the world. And these were subject matter experts, alumni, other educators, facilitators, but also platform providers, and also ICH alumni were central to everything that's happened. I have to thank the Queen Elizabeth the Jubilee Trust, and I look at Andrew for that and say they were the catalyst to get our uh, content out there. So with that as a backdrop, what we've done over the times is that we've changed the practice. We've gone to a collaborative model of developing and delivering the content. We've put in place a robust pedagogy so that it all brings the different threads together. We've worked with platforms, and those are platforms outside of uh, ICH and LSHDM, and that's uh, platforms like FutureLearn. We've looked at always 
delivering high quality at a minimum or free cost level. And that has been a major priority for us. In the process of the last five years of development, we've created more than 600 plus learning resources, and these are open access resources. So under a Creative Commons license, that means that you can use them, you can download them and reuse them, and even adapt them. That means you don't have to be reliant on what are the copyright issues that are around learning resources. We have created eight online courses. They now are available on demand and they are CPD accredited. Over this period, we've had over 36,000 plus participants from 180 countries. And what's interesting is that also 51.5% were women who were participating in online learning. 46.5% of the people who participated were in full-time employment showing us that lifelong learning is an important part of what we do next and we must deliver on that. We've evaluated it and I apologize it looks quite small there um, for lack of time but we've evaluated how and what have participants done on these courses and it's been from just simply understanding the subject to delivering to a transformational level at a local um, location. Um, I'm just going back, those are that's the list of courses that we've we've already got and active and glaucoma is on its way. So we've really tried to use technology to shift that model of dependency that we had that people had to come to a training center and try to work across networks and beyond that one dependency that we've had. I want to very quickly walk you through what would an open online course be? And I'm using the example of course that we've delivered on retinopathy of prematurity. It's a four week course. It begins with the participant understanding what is ROP, what is prematurity, and how big is that problem? So what is the epidemiology behind it? And then trying to understand how big is that problem at a local level? In the second week, we've worked very closely with neonatologists and neonatal nurses to understand what needs to be done to prevent ROP from even developing. So what is the quality of care that needs to be put in place what needs to be done within the neonatal intensive care units? Should ROP develop? How do we detect it? That's what we look at very closely in week three. How do you detect it quickly and manage it correctly? How do you involve the parents? What do you do to counsel them? Should the treatment not go as it needs to? And the final week is long-term management. ROP once established is not going to go away. And so the child will need long-term management. The parents will need support. So what this shows is that our course is very unusual. It looks at the whole journey and the whole program that needs to be put in place in order to deliver ROP care. And this is how we've tailored our courses so that they're practical, and applicable at different levels. So we've tried to address the quality, access and cost as much as we can. So going forward, what we want to do is that quality, anything that we put online, there is an expectation that it will always remain updated. So there is the element of sustaining that quality the ROP course, which launched only two years ago, has already been updated twice. The trachoma one has been updated four times. So the quality and the sustainability has to be part of the planning that we do. Access, the demand that we now have is not simply access, but it's providing that additional flexibility for learning and personalization for the needs of the learner. And of course, 
beyond just the cost of attending, our, our audience are demanding an accreditation for what they've learned, value for what they've, they've put together. And we want to work closely with regional partners because this belongs to all of us. So this is our future plan. What we want to do in the immediate future is to start by taking what we've already created and put together stackable, flexible, accredited postgraduate programs that will allow a wider audience to get engaged with the learning, particularly understanding about what is research, how do you get involved in doing research, and also using evidence in practice, and then building on that towards diseases, and hopefully, should their career pathways allow for it, come and finish it off with an MSc degree. So this is our vision for the next few years and building this as yet another element of what ICH wants to do. So really what we feel very strongly about the pathways for education is that we no longer want to sit with it within one core, but it's now become a catalyst for doing things in different ways around the world. So thank you for listening. Great, thank you very much, Daksha. I'm going to invite Stephen Gachui, who's going to come to talk to us about um, some of the work he did for his PhD, but also around research capacity strengthening in general. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I'm going to tell you the story of a trial I did as an illustration of what research capacity development can achieve. I will not start again by saying that I once met Alan because you know what happens to everybody who meets Alan. I'll tell you about a disease you don't often read about in your books. You don't hear about it in prevention of blindness meetings because it doesn't cause blindness. You may lose vision in one eye. What worse than that is that it kills these patients in the end. And I was very happy to get a grant to do some work in this field because that's a rare opportunity indeed. So this is just different levels of disease that we see. And unfortunately, whenever I open my books, they said that it was a rare disease of elderly men. And that's not what I was seeing. I was seeing it in young people, women in their thirties and forties. And when I tried to look up any information about it, it was a problem because there was no trial evidence at all to guide what we were doing. I did a Cochrane review and found no trial, not one. We were treating a very serious disease in the whole world using the evidence from case series and case reports. There is uh, also a very high incidence of this disease, despite availability of ART. It has a lot to do with HIV. In fact, they, it really came on the scene in our region of the world once the HIV pandemic hit. And remember, this is not about, the story today is not about this tumor. It's about the networks that helped build research capacity. And I first got aware of this because of a Ugandan called Atenia Gaba, who used to present work about this at our conferences. And that really got me interested. And people like Keith Waddell, who some of you may know. And so we sought to do a trial when we got money to do this. And this was part of my PhD work. And Matthew was my supervisor. I'll keep name dropping every once in a while so that you can see how research capacity is built. And hopefully also if I name drop a famous person, then you'll pay attention. So the question was, if we used five FU drops after surgical excision, which is what we do with most of these tumors, would we reduce the recurrence? And uh, our objectives was mainly to compare the recurrence rate at one year and on uh, secondary, uh, secondarily to look at the mean time to recurrence, how long does it take before the tumor recurs? And what were the core factors of recurrence? And as with every trial, it's good to describe the adverse effects. So we worked in four different centers. And I'm showing you this again to show you just the power of networks. The most northern site that you see there is Kitale Hospital, which is where Hilary Rono was working. And so he was one of the partners who helped me conduct this study. And I wasn't surprised later on when he came on and did his master's and did his PhD. So we ended up enrolling uh, the 47 participants in each arm. Uh, in the interest of time, let's just move on to where the results are. So what happened at one year? In the 5FU group, after surgical excision, used 5FU for a month. We only had five out of 47 recurrences. It was 
and the placebo group, which was using artificial tears instead of the five or few drops, we had 17 or 36% recurrence, which gives a crude odds ratio of 0.21 and the adjusted ratio after we took care of imbalances in people using ARTs and cigarette smoking. But simple result, we managed to reduce the relative risk by about 71%, which was quite an achievement. And the other big achievement of this trial actually was that it was the first trial of its kind in the world. Remember I told you when we did a Cochrane review, we found no trials at all. Um, that was a Kaplan-Meier survival estimates, which showed that is, people who are on the 5 few arm were doing a lot better than the uh, placebo group. The main cofactor of recurrence was people who had a larger tumor were more likely to have a recurrence. And uh, we concluded that four weeks treatment with these uh, eye drops was very effective in reducing the recurrence. It's actually very safe and well tolerated. And uh, it's readily available because we have to reconstitute it ourselves and we use it for other things in ophthalmology besides uh, treatment of this tumor. And below that was a real patient before and one year after treatment. We published that in the Lancet Global Health and uh, you've seen the papers downstairs. But again, I want you to see the names there. Some are not famous apart from the last one, I suppose. But others are people in this school. Helen Weiss was well, you know, supported as a lot of statistics. And uh, I have a host of other people there who have worked with me in different things, um, in the different centers. And some of them are actually interested in research because of having been involved in this project. So those were the many people who supported our work in the different institutions. Uh, BCPB funded this work, and it's sad to see that they're not there anymore. But the meat of the story, how do you build research capacity? If we had done this maybe 10 years ago, uh, you might have only had David Meyer, the professor in South Africa, on that picture. Out of all those people, those who love to count can count. Two thirds of those people are alumni of this school. And that's an achievement. So how do you build capacity? Because that's the thing we need to do. And again, I'm hoping that in another year or two, we'll see a few more names. I see some people in the audience who are hopefully will put a picture of them in the West African corner there. Ada, no pressure. Building capacity is a long-term exercise. It takes a long time. My first contact with research was working as a resident during my elective time at Kikuyu Hospital in Kenya with David Yoston, who many of you know. And the first assignment he gave me was, could you enter some data we were doing on the monitoring of cataract surgery? And that got published in the British Journal of Ophthalmology. And with that slowly, I started getting involved in many other things, met many more people. But the most important statement David told me is, ICH is a good place to show your face. So I met Alan and dot, dot, dot. <laughs> But later on in a conference in East Africa, while I was looking for a chance, actually I was looking for money to do a study on or a trial on OSSN, I ran into Matthew and we sat together and my life changed. I got a chance to do a PhD, which was a huge piece of work, but I was very happy because we managed to publish, we got 10 publications out of that PhD project. So it's been a long walk. And after that, I got a postdoctoral grant with his support and we were able to do so much more. The other thing is really mentorship. And you know, in, with a handshake, it's not just mentorship, it's friendships, it's relationships. Shake hands across barriers. Befriend people. The small little things you do for them, you don't know where they're going to lead. You know, David gave me a little assignment. I don't think, he knew if or I knew I was going to be doing the kind of things I'm doing now. And that I've also realized that when you're doing some of the most profound things in life, you don't even know you are. You think you're just doing your job. So just be friendly, cross barriers, talk to someone that you normally wouldn't talk to. And just a word of encouragement goes a long way. That got me going a long way. I'll never forget having come here for the first time to a Vision 2020 course with Alan Foster. And he came from Cambridge early in the morning to meet me in the hotel where I was staying to have breakfast with me 
and asked me what would I like to do in my life. I had only read about Allen in journals and books, and that was a life-changing experience. Another statement, which and I'll mention David Maybe here, um, David Maybe supervised Matthew's supervisor. So I don't know whether you know about this, David, but David once told me, you know, you're like my great grandson <laughs> and you have good genes <laughs> because I was clearly following a lineage of people who had done very well in research. Well, like most great grandsons, I didn't do trachoma. Sometimes they go off and do their own thing. <laughs> but to our consolation, I was in the neighborhood because they were working on trachoma and I was working on the bulba conjunctiva, which is not very far from there. <laughs> And lastly, which is more looking in the future, it's not about individuals. I've had a lot put into me, but I'd like to build a team. And we really need to start building up teams of people, hubs of people, so that when I'm in Nairobi, I can have a research coordinator, I can have a project coordinator, I can have staff and project managers who would help me be able to do more than what I've been able to do at the present. Also building up infrastructure and things like that. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very, very much, Stephen. Um, I'd like to invite um, at this point, uh, to, uh, yeah, Simon, great, to uh, come and talk to us about some of the cornea infection work we've been doing. Thank you. In the interest of, <clears throat> in the interest of time, I decided to have the acknowledgement slide on my T-shirt. <laughs> uh, just missing Matthew. Uh, but Matthew, thank you so much for bringing me to ICH. So I'm presenting this on behalf of myself and my colleague, Jeremy, who had to leave. Uh, but what we have been doing basically is uh, looking after patients with cornea infections. And these are some of the patients that I've looked after in Uganda. <clears throat> As individuals, they may not mean much. Uh, that's Gertrude, an eight-year-old grandmother and Ronald, a young father, 25 years old. Gertrude and, and Ronald form part of the 2 million people who go blind from this cornea infection. And over the last decade, our group has been grappling with the question of how do we prevent people like this from needless blindness due to this disease? Our work has been mostly in Uganda in the last few years, and this was part of my opportunity to do a PhD at the ICH, uh, which had uh, 12 publications, Stephen Kishu, uh, who had 10, and <laughs> <laughs> I did promise you that, didn't I? And, uh, but what we learned was that uh, fungal keratitis was the most common cause. And the risk factors were uh, traditional eye medicine, which is a common problem where I come from, and trauma, but also HIV and diabetes were significant contributors to the risk. But what was really shocking was that majority of the patients were coming late to the hospital where too little could be done. It was too late and they ended up with poor outcomes. When we looked at their three months data, about half of them had vision impairment. A significant proportion had hideous, hideous looking uh, corneal scars and about 10% uh, lost their eyes due to this infection. What we really saw on discovering why these patients eventually came late, we realized it was actually not their problem. It was a problem of the major weaknesses in the health system. So if you look at this uh, <coughs> diagram, uh, you can see at the top, I don't know, left or right, depending on where you're seated, is home, is where the action happens. Uh, when the patients start getting the symptoms. About 20% of those come straight to the eye hospital where we have the facilities and the care that they need. But majority would come within eight days. Now, eight days for corneal infections, that's already late. But what was shocking was that the 80% within two days had already interfaced with the health system. This was either a primary health facility nearby or a dispensary. And that's where everything broke down. Many ended up in circular movements and some came as late as 42 days to our hospital. And this has been the highlight of why we need to strengthen primary eye care. And this was captured in the Lancet uh, Commission report 
And this case study has also been taken up by the IAPB in the IPEC training, those who have done that. This is the work that has informed that decision, why we need to inform and strengthen primary eye care. Like I said, majority of the patients had fungal keratitis. And so we treated them with natamycin, which was the, the first line then. The challenge was that not everyone did well with natamycin. Actually, we just, with the, the report which we published, we had a number of patients who did not do well on the natamycin alone. So these are some of the patients I picked up from our series. And you can see that these patients presented uh, with cornea infection. We started them on natamycin, but they went ahead to worsen. So on review, uh, they, the infiltrate sizes were increasing. Some had developed new um, infiltrates. At that point, we introduced cohexidine, and they went on to do well at three months. So what we were observing was really consistent with some of the work which had been done previously, which had showed that cohexidine had a role. And actually, uh, in 2015, the Cochrane Review had, had showed from the only two trials then that compared cohexidine with natamycin, that there was a slight advantage in using cohexidine uh, over natamycin. And this is what led to our group uh, starting to, to think about a trial uh, of cohexidine versus natamycin. And the first, trial was, the first trial was done by my colleague, uh, led by my colleague, Dr. Jeremy Hoffman in Nepal. Uh, where we wanted to compare as a non-inferiority trial, uh, corexidine versus uh, natamycin. And we randomized patients presenting with uh, fungal keratitis. Uh, these were then randomized either to receive corexidine 0.2% or natamycin uh, 5%. And we followed them up uh, periodically. What we wanted to see was that at three months, who had the best uh, vision? This was conducted in uh, South uh, Nepal at a hospital called Sagmatha Chondri Eye Hospital. It's a very busy hospital, and they see about over 100 patients with microbial keratitis per month. And the, the results of this trial have just been published in ophthalmology. What did we find? Uh, let's do a drum roll. Um, we actually found that at three months, the patients in the Corhexidine arm um, did worse than uh, natamycin. This is not what we had uh, hoped for as the result. But putting this in context, we found that this was only when you look at the vision outcome. But actually, the patients in the corhexidine arm um, actually did well. They healed, although they just had worse vision. Now, the performance of corhexidine is comparable to how uh, voriconazole performs. And currently, voriconazole is still the second line agent after uh, natamycin and still really widely used in many places in the US and in Europe. But not to forget that natamycin is, st is still largely unavailable in many parts of the world, especially in low and middle income countries. So this does not relegate the role of cohexidine. It still has a place, especially in places where the natamycin is not largely available. And following the lessons from this, we're currently doing a trial, multi-center trial in, in Tanzania and Uganda. And we are comparing natamycin alone versus a combination of natamycin and chlorhexidine. What we have been learning over the last few years, uh, just to reiterate that uh, the elephant in the room is still fungus. The incidence of uh, cornea infections keeps on rising. The fungal keratitis is really challenging to treat. And so that's why even when we start the treatment, we have to have this conversation with our patients on the expectation. It is difficult, it's going to take long, and sometimes the results may not be great in terms of vision. So if you have monatomycin, by all means go for it. It's still the first line and much superior to the others. But where you don't have natamycin or where patients are failing on natamycin, chlorhexidine is your go-to drug. You sound like a drug. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much.
Super, thank you very much, Simon. Um, can I invite um, Victor and Elvin? You come and talk to us about uh, the work of the uh, Community Eye Health Journal. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Um, the journal is probably uh, 34 years old this year. We've done 113 issues, and it's definitely something completely unique in the world of eye health and eye care delivery. And it um, dovetails really well with everything else ICH is doing. And really, is, um, I was thinking of asking people to raise their hands if you've either written for the journal or reviewed an article or otherwise um, contributed, or you're a member of the editorial committee. We have a show of hands. Fantastic. No, it's wonderful, really wonderful to be part of it. Um, now, the journal was started um, just to flip forward a slide by uh, Murray McGavin, as you saw in Alan's slides earlier today, back in 1988, um, followed by Victoria Francis as the second editor, and then myself. Um, but it's much more than just the three of us as editors. It takes a big team. Um, it takes everybody who showed their hands, and it takes all of the, we've got um, people here like Lance, who's been with the journal, uh, started with Victoria, rounded by 2004-05, um, Lance, say hi. Lance has been our designer for, for that long. Um, Paddy Rickard sitting next to him is the editor of the French edition. And we have, I don't know if Critis was able to join online, but we also have a fantastic South Asia edition, very capably led by uh, Kriti Shukla under the supervision and guidance of G.V. Murthy over in India. So we have, as I mentioned already, two of the editions, the French edition. Just be spoken to Heidi is about 2006, so, so 16 years old. So it's it's been going a lot longer um, than, than I, I even realized actually, time's gone so fast. Um, and Franco from Africa, as Serge will probably attest to if you speak to her afterwards today. Um, Franco from Africa is really an area that has a massive need for IK resources, um, as, as everywhere else in, in the world and learned middle income countries. But um, Lucifer from Africa probably most affected in most need and we did have for a very brief period one issue of a of a Portuguese language journal um, but definitely Franco from Africa has a, has a great need for it. The reason we needed a journal really and what Murray realized when he was in Afghanistan is that there's no real access for up-to-date eye care information for the people who actually deliver eye, eye health. Not the researchers, but the practicing ophthalmologists, optometrists, and um, nurses and allied health professionals who work and deliver eye care. Um, and these days, more and more journals are publishing open access. But even then, a, a large proportion of the research and of the information is not really applicable to low and middle income countries. Thanks to ICH and the team here, that is rapidly changing as well. Um, but the reason for having a journal is to pull together this research and knowledge in a way that's really accessible and easy to pick up and use for very, very busy clinicians. Um, and just to speak very briefly about the other editions we have in the, uh, you can see our South Asia edition off to the side. And we are um, making rapid progress towards the Chinese edition of the journal that will, if all goes well, hopefully launch in um, beginning of June 2023. Um, and we're also speaking with IPB and working together with partners in Latin America about a Spanish edition. And just as to show that in addition to sort of review articles we commission, um, we also, part of what makes us so unique in the journal is that we reach out to people in the field and ask, we ask people to contribute case studies and their real lived experience because it's about where the theory, you know, where the tie hits the road. So how is IK actually implemented and what can we learn from each other? So I very much see uh, the journal as playing a very facilitative role in helping people across the world to share their experience and, and best practice. In fact, um, you know, it's not, as I mentioned, it's for the whole I team and readers have been telling us that they learn so much from one another in this way and it inspires them to think beyond the clinic and to reach beyond the clinic. So a lot of, we've done quite a lot of surveys. In fact, Victoria Francis did our first survey in 2005. And um, in two of the surveys we've had in one in 2010 and one in 2015, we've had an optometrist in Nigeria send us this quote to say, 
without this journal, I am in utter darkness. Um, and a lot of our readers say that it's the only source of up-to-date eye care information. And it helps them to feel less alone. They, they're part of a community of practice, which is so important. And um, we also have a large proportion of our readers who are educators and are using the journal Adapt the Information, which like the open online courses that Dutra spoke about, everything we produce is open access, it's free, all of our images can be used um, for slides and we've even in our strategy meeting this week we've had people talk about um, students and talking to them and saying that for some of their courses they just handed a copy of the journal you know on a particular topic and exams are set based on on journal topics uh, recently it's not that recent anymore but 2018 2019 we worked on developing the community eye health journal smartphone app and this app is very much designed to be useful in a low and middle income country setting. And big thank you to Andrew in the Peak Foundation and also Tyson who funded this development, really invested in it. And um, we've got 2,500 active users. We'd really like to see it grow. So you can find the app on either the App Store or on uh, Google Play by looking for Community Eye Health Journal, which is CEHJ. So please spread the word. It allows users to uh, bookmark articles and download them for offline use. So when they go out in the field, for example, they can have all the ROP or child eye health um, articles that they want to have with them. Now, the app came out just in time for COVID-19. So um, as soon as that happened, uh, just huge accolades and thanks to the Lynx program, to Marcia and her team, because the first thing you did really um, when Victor was involved as well, is decide to convene a meeting for all the links partnerships about how do we, what does COVID-19 mean for eye health? How can we continue to implement eye health programs in these new and difficult circumstances? So um, convened this fantastic webinar that had, I think, almost 300 participants and people shared best practice and ideas and guidelines and so on. And that gave us the idea to as quickly as possible produce a, an issue of the journal on COVID-19. And these are just some examples of articles that we that we did. So <clears throat> how to make hand sanitizer, how to make a very quick mask and so on. Um, and that really led to a new way of working for us. We decided to publish the articles online as soon as they, they were available. And um, it also meant that we could have so many more people giving input into the journal and into the content. So we had eight authors, uh, co-authors um, for the editorial article, for example. Um, now, <clears throat> we have, um, not, in addition to the eye care team members who read the journal, we do have policy makers and people at Ministry of Health level, and this quote for me just, it just blew us away really. You know, you know these people read the journal and we know that the, it has an impact, but to hear that that issue helps someone plan their eye care delivery during the pandemic, this was incredibly satisfying. So one of the benefits of the new ways of working is that our editorial committee has really expanded. Where before the pandemic, we met in London, and that meant only people who were really in the UK could join us. We now have all of our editorial committee meetings online, and um, many of the people in this room are members of the committee, and we're really grateful to have their input. Um, so we're also looking, working with IPB to um, develop contacts from um, Western Pacific area, and more people from South, from South America, from Latin America to, to join our committee. And also looking at mid-level eye personnel <clears throat> to come and sit on the committee, um, whether that's on the editorial committee or as readers. And um, the members of the Chinese editorial committee, I think they'll be joining us from May onwards. And then, um, yeah, so that's really good. And they're already involved in, the, in producing the research issue, which is coming out later this year. Um, we had our first glaucoma webinar, and actually what I needed to mention is Victor, who joined us as a medical editor of the journal, um, because Victor and I worked really closely together with Heiko as well on that glaucoma issue, and Victor realised he couldn't live without us, <laughs> so he joined us as the medical editor, and um, glaucoma is also Victor's area of research, so um, we worked on a fantastic issue on glaucoma that looked at a you know, wide range of topics, and these are some of the authors of that issue who came and talked about their articles in the journal. And we were really pleased to have 87 people join us and um, asking lots of questions. And it, that really gave us an idea of how the, how the journal is, a, is, um, is impacting the readers and what else readers need. Um, so, for example, they, there were lots of questions about glaucoma and children. So we're looking at potentially 
having an issue on glaucoma in children. Um, and from the survey we did afterwards, everybody really just were interested in having webinars about all our issues, which was took us by surprise. So we'll be looking at doing more of those in future. Um, and we also asked readers if they'd be interested in joining us in focus groups to help plan issues. And everybody said yes, which is really good. So um, a few few tips and ideas in the future. In terms of funding is always, you know, a challenge, it's a very challenging environment. So we're looking at really consolidating how we distribute. So reducing print copies where we can. Um, but we really know that, especially in Francophone Africa, for example, print copies are sorely needed and many countries as well. Um, so while at the same time we're actively marketing the online version and the app, also consolidating the print issue, but our key focus is going to be on partnering with educational institutions globally. Because it's one thing to train somebody and then they often work, but I think part of our responsibility is the continuing professional development and education of eye health workers at all levels once they get out in the field and work. And the journal is a way to keep in touch with people who've been trained. Um, and then very quickly, just thank you to all our supporters. You're amazing. And without it, you couldn't do any of this work. Um, and we're really pleased that all of our supporters that you see on here are also members of our, our strategy group, which meets twice a year. And we get so much support, encouragement, and advice, and feedback on what we do, and ways of strengthening both our content and our reach and our you know, sort of capacity in fundraising. So we're extremely grateful for these partnerships. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, Elmi. That was terrific to hear about the work of the journal. Um, so um, we're getting towards the end of our, our time together, and uh, the, we've just got a few minutes to kind of open open the conversation up to, to the floor, as it were. And I mean, there may be uh, some folk here, some alumni and others, who might like to say something. And um, we've got a, a microphone. I think you and Victor have got microphones. Um, so if you'd like to say anything, just pop your hand up in the air, and they'll they'll um, come and find you. And uh, I guess um, probably keep 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 things fairly focused because. I'm sure there might be a few people who'd like to say things. Over to you. Yes, I just want to say congratulations on the anniversary. I think we've probably had a history of culture even as long as the, as, as, as you both are, as much as you've been in existence. I think there's people here that much, you know much more about that uh, than me, but I think people are asking. Mm -hmm. Fantastic for many years. We, we've had connections through people doing such fascinating work, fashion schools, giving uh, that connection and helping that board. I think probably most fundamentally, what we've seen, what I've seen uh, this afternoon, has really been, I guess, the connection around goals and values, and the sort of shared agenda that we've had. I mean, you've been so, you know, so incredibly influential in putting public health on the eye health agenda that absolutely underpins. Our work, it really drives our work, and and the work you've done. I mean, we've heard, you know, we've heard the from the home, the home the town, but from the journal from Simon in terms of the evidence you're describing, some of the work you're doing to try to implement the strategy to subscribe there. The lots of very commission. I mean, you're so influential in driving the work that last year in the UN and achieving the UN resolution. So, so I mean, it's been a fantastic friendship, and I hope you'll continue Thank you. Sorry about the stuff, but I can stand in. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. I'm Catherine Cross, uh, and I was the program director for Sight Savers um, for the past few years. And I'd like to say that working with ICH was one of the most rewarding parts of the job. Um, you've seen Sight Savers in several cases as being a funder, but we were a lot more than that. Um, not only I was on the, well, several of us were on the committees for originally the, um, uh, the journal uh, and, and also for supporters. Um, but we've had such wide experience in Africa with so many field staff uh, who knew candidates. And therefore, I think we were able to channel, help channel the right people onto the courses, help to the journal to, to find correspondence um, in various parts of the world. So it was an extremely good experience and it's very nice to be here again. 
Thank you. Does anyone else want to reminisce on their time? Oh, Andy Cassis Brand. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a fantastic afternoon. I knew I was in for an absolute treat from the moment it started to the moment it finished. Um, I just wanted to um, to build on what Alan Foster said right at the start, which is a really around, I feel that the, the ICH and its masters and its other education programs really help shift people. Uh, it's not just about knowledge, it's about empowering people, giving, yes, giving them knowledge, giving them a network, giving, inspiring them, and I was fortunate enough to be, when I finished, I was fortunate to be invited back to do some lectures around the work that I've done since I finished my master's course. And I, I remember I used to say to the students when I was, was talking with them, I, I felt that the M in master's stands for maturing. It's maturing clinically beyond the four walls of the hospital. It's maturing so that you actually take real ownership for a defined catchment population in a holistic multi-disease pathway process, which is not something really very many clinicians do in a, in a, in a hospital setting, um, unless they have to be someone like clinical director where they're kind of been forced to or encouraged to. And the other end for me was really maturing into managing yourself to, to really, public health is a long-term well, it's not a quick fix. Yes, you can go in and grab a few cataracts and make some people see better, but to actually shift the program forward is a long term. So it's about being maturing into being sustainable, uh, not just the health service that you're working with, but also the personal one. Because I think sometimes it, you can get very carried away and very excited and, um, and infused, but you can also get very frustrated with the pace of change, particularly if you're a surgeon who's used to swishing a knife and getting a result within 20 minutes sort of thing. So that was one of the things that I felt I just wanted to reinforce is that maturing thing that the masters in particular does for me. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Was looking around for Professor Maybe, but I see he's gone. So he said I should say something about um, with the partnership relationship between the Gambia Eye Care Program, the Medical Research Council, and ICH. The population of Gambia was declared trauma free last year. So great looking around. I don't see anyone else putting their hand up. Um, we're almost uh, at, at the end of our afternoon together here, the formal part. Um, and I'd like to uh, say thank you very, very much to all of you both here in the room and online uh, who, who've joined us. It's been a real delight to, to meet together uh, again um, physically. Thank you very much uh, to, to my colleagues who've uh, worked really hard and, and done fantastic presentations. And uh, it's been a real, uh, really interesting afternoon just listening again to to some of the work that you, you you've been doing leading on and just you know, really proud of, of 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 your achievements and and immensely grateful to your hard work and dedication um in our away kind of day week and a half so sorry two and a half days sorry, it wasn't a week and a half but like a week and a half um uh, we, we we i think one of the last questions we asked each other is, you know what why, why am i here why, why am i part of ich and it was very interesting uh to, to hear the responses and hannah, hannah had a a, a lovely long, a lovely long sort of piece about it. But I think a very um, frequent recurring theme was 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 the sense of uh, passion, passion about what we're doing. We are passionate about uh, seeking to uh, address, um, you know, improving eye, eye health worldwide. And we 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 really enjoy working together. I think we're immensely blessed to have such wonderful colleagues, uh, not just within ICH, but globally. Uh, it, it, it is such a rich environment for relating. And you know, you've, you've heard some of the stories um, from Stephen and, and Simon, who I've worked with particularly closely over the years. And, uh, and there'll be many other uh, relationships like that in, in this room and, and, and beyond. And, and, and thank you again to the people who support us in, in many, many ways. And uh, we, we mentioned a number of them through the afternoon, but we are very, very grateful to ongoing partnership. And as, as Catherine mentioned, it's not just 
about the financial support. It's, it's much, much deeper than that. It's about you know, working with you in programs and, and, and seeking to come alongside in the, in the capacity strengthening work that you are doing in many cases. Um, I think we're pretty much at the end. Um, I hope very much that those of you who can will join us downstairs. We've, we've got a, a reception, um, some drinks and some, some nibbles to, 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 to spend a bit more time together with. And around, around that space, you'll find there are lots of boards uh, with, with pictures and um, some publications, um, various things like the journal and the Lancet Commission, you can, you can pick up and, and, and take home if you'd like to encourage you to do that. Um, so to, to find that, it's basically up the stairs and down the stairs all the way into this one. Okay, thank you very much again for joining us. <laughs>